The House will come back to order. Representative Basenecker. Mr. Speaker, pro tem, I move for a call of the House. The motion is properly sustained. Will the sergeants please close the doors? Uh, Mr. Schiebel, please turn on the chimes. Members, push your buttons to indicate your presence. Representatives Bacon, <coughs> Bockenfeld, Bradley, Catlin, Doherty, DeGraff, Epps, Evans, Gonzalez Gutierrez, Holtorf, <coughs> Judah, Lynch, Mabry, Parenti. Yeah, Puglisi, Sharbini, Soper, Valdez, Velasco, Weinberg. Wilson, Winter, Woodrow, Young, Representatives Bockenfeld, Catlin, Doherty, DeGraff, Epps, Evans, Gonzalez Gutierrez, Lynch, Mabry, Puglisi, Sharbini, Valdez, Velasco, Wilson, Woodrow and Young, and Madam Speaker. Yeah. Speaker McCluskey is excused. Representative Basenecker. Mr. Speaker, pro tem, I move that the call be raised. It has been moved that the call be raised. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the call is raised. Reports of committees of reference. Committee on Agriculture, Water, and Natural Resources. After consideration on the merits of Kim Nierkin's following, Senate Bill 275 as amended and 295 as amended, be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. 
Committee on State Civic Military and Veterans Affairs, after consideration on the merits of committee recommends following. Senate Bills 286 as amended, 292 and 302 be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. Committee on Transportation, Housing, and Local Government, after consideration on the merits of committee recommends the following. Senate Bill 213 be amended as followed and also amended be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. Committee on Finance, after consideration on the merits of committee recommends the following. Senate Bills 148, 263, and 267 as amended be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. Senate Bill 248 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. Conference Committee Reports. First report of First Conference Committee on Senate Bill 60. This report amends the re-revised bill. To the President of the Senate and the Conference Speaker of the committee House. Conference Committee reports will be printed in the journal. Message from the Senate. Madam Speaker, the Senate has passed. Message from the reading. Senate will be printed in the journal. Message from the reviser. We hear with transmit. Message from the reviser will be printed in the journal. Introduction of bills. Senate Bill 296 by Senators Winter, F. and Marchman, also Representatives Bacon and Herod, concerning protections for students against discriminatory practices at school. Senate Bill 296 will be assigned to the Committee on Judiciary. Senate Bill 299 by Senator Cutter, also Representative Titone concerning the requirement to acquire epinephrine auto-injectors for placement at institutions of higher education. Senate Bill 299 will be assigned to the Committee on Public and Behavioral Health and Human Services. There we go. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move to lay over House Bill 1282 until July 1st. Seeing no objection, House Bill 1282 will be laid over until July 1st. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move to lay over House Bill 1142 until July 1st. Seeing no objection, House Bill 1142 will be laid over until July 1st. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move the following bills be added to the special orders calendar at 3.02 p.m. Senate Bill 54, Senate Bill 76, Senate Bill 285, Senate Bill 14, Senate Bill 199, Senate Bill 259, Senate Bill 34, Senate Bill 97, Senate Bill 269, House Bill 1194, Senate Bill 205, Senate Bill 257, and House Bill 1220. Uh, Madam Majority Leader, I believe you meant Senate Bill 203. Correct, Madam Speaker, it's Senate Bill 203. Excellent. The bills listed by the Majority Leader will be added to the special orders calendar at 3.02 p.m. Representative Kipp. Members, you've heard the motion, seeing no objection. The House will now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for consideration of special orders. Representative Kipp will take the chair. The committee will come to order. With your unanimous consent, the bills will be read by title unless there is a request for reading a bill at length. Committee reports are printed and in your bill folders. Floor amendments will be shown on the screen and in your iPads. Bills will be laid over upon request of the motion of the majority leader and the coat rule is very, very relaxed. Um, Mr. Schiebel, will you please read the title of SB 23054? 
Senate Bill 54 by Senator Danielson, also Representatives Garcia and Velasco, concerning the duties of the Office of Liaison for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives and in connection with making an appropriation. Thank you, Representative. Representative Garcia. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the committee. Hold on one second. Hey, everybody, keep it down. We got bills to go through. We need to take your conversations off to the side if you need to talk. Representative Garcia. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this is a very important bill that everyone is going to support and adore and love and be proud to vote yes on today and when it comes to thirds. Senate Bill 054 is a bill that builds upon the Office of Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives. Last year, this body started the Office of Murdered and Missing Indigenous Relatives to support Indigenous communities when their community members go missing. Unfortunately, this country has been silent when these cases happen for far too long, and last year, Colorado said no more. What this bill does this year is it clarifies that the office needs to have an additional liaison in addition to the director to be a go-to and a support system for the families of missing and murdered indigenous relatives. It also clarifies language around something. <laughs> I lost it. Well, while you're thinking Hold about on a it, sec. Um, go ahead. <laughs> um, representatives, while you're thinking about it, can you please move the bill? Oh, and I, I move Senate Bill 54. Thank you. Uh, Representative Velasco. <laughs> Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And uh, this bill improves and bolsters the support for families, improves the response time when someone goes missing, ensures accountability in reporting, honors the work of the task force, and deepens our state's commitment to addressing this epidemic of violence. We worked hard to arrive at a consensus between the Department of Public Safety the Southern Ute and Ute Mountain Ute tribes, and the other incredible advocates who have worked tirelessly to make this happen. And we do have uh, three amendments today. Um, thank you. Would you like to move them now? Yes. I'm. Should I move them three, the three together? No. Mm -mm. One at a time. Yeah. One at a time. Okay. I move Amendment L10 to Senate Bill 54. And ask that it be displayed, please. Thank you very much. Um, L010 has been properly moved and is properly displayed. Please proceed. Uh, Representative Garcia. Thank you, Madam Chair. So what L10 does is it clarifies and per it clarifies that. What we're asking for within communication and data sharing is really to um, support the information and the data sharing between the Office of Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives, between the, um, the law enforcement and the family, and to make sure that all of the interests are taken into consideration when deciding and making decisions on what information is actually shareable that does not violate the integrity of the investigation. We Thank asked for an I vote. Thank you. Is there further discussion on L010 to SB054? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of SB um, of L010 to SB23054. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. L010 passes. Um, Representative Lesko. Thank you so much. I move Amendment L11 to Senate Bill 54 and ask to, for it to be displayed, please. Thank you. Uh, um, L011 has been moved and is properly displayed. Representative Velasco. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And these amendments just creates a dedicated phone line for missing or murdered indigenous relatives that operates 24-7 uh, for 
because we know that these incidents may happen at any time of the day, it may happen on the weekends, it may happen at night, and we want to make sure that there's someone available to connect our families with the appropriate agencies. Thank and you. Is there any further yeah. discussion on L011? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L011. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. L011 is adopted. Uh, Representative Velasco. Um, I move amendment L12 to Senate Bill 54 and ask that it be displayed. Thank you. L012 has been properly moved and is properly displayed. Who would like to explain it to us? Representative Garcia. Thank you, Madam Chair. So what L what L12 does is it appropriates the funding necessary in order to operate the 24-hour uh, hotline. And we ask for an I vote. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on L012? Seeing none, the question before uh, Representative Holtorf. Good thing you were there. Representative Holtorf, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in committee, we heard this bill. There were some issues between the department and the bill sponsors. From what I've seen with the amendments, now those issues are being resolved, which I think is very important. Um, this, the question I have with this particular bill, right, or this amendment right here, is does that reside in the Department of Public Health or, and they're going to staff that or is it within another department and then that hotline is going to be staffed and resourced in a different department? If so, could you explain how that works in the context of the bill and what the bill is trying to accomplish? Representative, Representative Velasco. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you so much, Representative Holtor, for your question. So these... Uh, hotline is going to live within the Department of Public Safety and is going to live within the Emergency Response Center. So we are going to utilize existing resources uh, to staff this line. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on L012? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L012 to SB 23054. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. L012 is adopted. Uh, to the bill, Representative Velasco. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And we ask for your yes vote. This is a very important follow-up to last year's bill. And our families need the support and need the resources uh, to make sure that we are able to find people when they go missing. Representative Garcia. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I also just want to uh, <clears throat> emphasize that what this bill is going to do is it's going to impact every single community that is represented under this chamber because we know that while we have um, our very incredible and amazing tribes in the, at the southern border, we know that the indigenous community lives all across the state. And this happens all across the state. Indigenous people are murdered or go missing everywhere. And this is important that this service is provided to every community all across the state. And so I urge an I vote. Thank you. I'm Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and before this bill came up on seconds, I was talking to the bill sponsors. And there's something that I think is really important. The first thing I want to say, we heard this in public health, and we realized that indigenous persons for some reason and there was some testimony that may or may not have explained that in the committee did not get the response time that those people need and deserve now a lot of that was uh, a bit structural between um, as it was, a, uh, as testimony explained, was between the law enforcement in the reservation and the local law enforcement and or the state law enforcement. 
And we talked about liaison, and we talked about crossing that divide. Because as much as I preach about the rural-urban divide, there's a law enforcement divide between indigenous law enforcement and our local and specifically state law enforcement. But here's where I want the bill sponsors to really pay close attention, because we talked about this. We need to extend rapid reporting to all citizens. I don't care where you're from, who you are, what color you are, all of them, what gender you are. And here's the thing, that the Amber Alert System works. I believe it's a federal system. It's not a state system. And that works when the right code is put in the computer. And there's certain criteria. But here's what I would like to see, and I don't know how we do this, but in the state of Colorado, if there is a young person that goes missing, indigenous or not, if it's African American, if it's Asian, if it's a young girl, especially my sympathy is to young women who go missing because they are kidnapped and taken into the human trafficking sphere. This is real. In those cases, I would like to see this Amber Alert type system expanded, and I would like to see it become an opt-out system, not an opt-in system. Because what I learned in committee, ladies and gentlemen, is this program, the Missing, Murdered, and Indigenous Persons Notification Program, is an opt-in system. If you're not a member of that community or related to that community or want to advocate for that community, you would never probably sign up of the near six million people in this state. And if something's going on in northeastern Colorado and somebody has been taken, and I'm at the gas station in Atwood, Colorado, and I've got this alert and I see something, believe me, the good people of rural Colorado are going to stop and maybe save somebody from a terrible ending. The most innocent. Those that deserve to be cared for, the kids. Uh, it can be sons and daughters. It can be teenagers who think they want to run away and they know not what they do. And they're being exploited by human traffickers or sexual deviants or whatever. So I want to talk with the bill sponsors. I'm going to support this bill, but we need to expand this. This needs to be expanded. And we need to figure out how we do that. So I want us to work together next session to figure this out. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on SB 23054? Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. 72 indigenous women have been kidnapped this year. That is a shocking and horrifying number. This bill is so important. We need to do something for these communities. It's, it is all over the state. It's not just one little niche area. It's everywhere. And we have the opportunity to do something for these women who have gone missing, and this is it. Please, please, please vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Representative Luck. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, I support the idea behind this, but there's a section in this bill that invokes in my reading Article 5, Section 34 of the State Constitution, and it brings me much concern. And so um, I'm not sure if I'll be able to support it based on that, but I do want to let you guys know that I appreciate where this is headed. I just have concerns about how we interact with that particular clause in our Constitution. So thank you. Thank you. Is there further discussion on SB 23054? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of SB 23054. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. SB 23054 is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, can you please read the title of SB 23076? Senate Bill 76 by Senators Coleman and Marchman, also representatives. Uh, McLaughlin and Vigil, concerning the continuation of the Colorado Youth Advisory Council and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Thank you, Representative Vigil. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Senate Bill 76 and the House Education Committee report. 
excellent. Um, who would like to talk about the Education Committee report? Representative McLaughlin. Thank you. We would like to win the award as the longest technical amendment to a bill. This was a, a mistake that was made um, in an office somewhere, and we had to change a lot of dates and titles and names, but it um, keeps the whole sense of the bill, but we had to move everything forward because um, they forgot. So it's a very long technical amendment, but um, it passes. It's a, it's a, it makes it still a good bill and even better. Um, thank you. Um, sponsors, I know you have another amendment. I just want to make sure it's not to the committee report before we adopt the committee report. Did you have another amendment? Yeah. Representative McLaughlin. No. We don't have an amendment, but um, I would like your attention on this one, please. We had a conceptual amendment, and it was actually put into the education thing, and it is, uh, we are naming this the Koyak Bill after Hugh McKean because Hugh McKean did so much for Koyak, and he loved those students, and he loved helping them. So we have now named this. Um, his partner is watching online, so if you want to look up at the camera and wave to her, um, she's there. <laughs> and uh, she couldn't make it here today. But we just appreciate what Hugh McKean did for Koyak over all these years. And um, he, had his, uh, he had a big heart, and that's, he put it into Koyak for all of us, as you know. So. So, so it was not a conceptual amendment. They actually put it in the report. So now we will pass the report. Okay. So the report <laughs> will make this official then. Wonderful. So um, all in favor of the Education Committee report, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Um, the Education Committee report, uh, SB 23076, is adopted. Um, to the bill, Representative McLaughlin. Yes, this is a sunset bill for Koyak. It's the Colorado Youth Advisory. They come in and um, they have student representatives from all over the state. They have um, one from every Senate district and then they have some from uh, the tribes. And they get together and come up with some really remarkable ideas for legislation. And they have to go through the whole process of it, but we are getting our youth voice heard in Colorado. Representative V. Hill. Thank you, Madam Chair and colleagues. I just want to ask for your yes vote on this. I know it is a very complicated, controversial bill, and uh, you know we really had to count our votes before we came up here. But I just want to say it's, um, you know, it's one thing to just say that the kids are our future, and we need to invest in them and and prepare them. And I think it's quite another to welcome them into this space and give them the opportunity to be heard and to help craft legislation. I've looked at some of the uh, COYAC recommended bills that have come through um, and and been part of our work this year, and I'm really proud and excited to to uh, take leadership on the next council. Thank you. Thank you. Is um, Representative McLaughlin. Just want to say, um, think of Hugh McKean when you vote today, please. Thanks. Thank you. Is there further discussion on SB 23076? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of SB 23076. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. no. SB 23076 <laughs> is adopted. This is a challenge. <laughs> Mr. Schiebel, can you please read the title of SB 23-285? Senate Bill 285 by Senators Priola and Hanson, also Representatives McCormick and Dixon, concerning energy and carbon management regulation in Colorado and in connection therewith, changing the name of the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission to the Energy and Carbon Management Commission, broadening the Commission's regulatory authority to include the regulation of certain geothermal resource operations and intrastate underground natural gas storage facilities and making an appropriation. Very impressive, Mr. Schiebel. Uh, Representative McCormick. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Senate Bill 23285 and the Appropriations Committee report. Um, thank you to the Appropriations Report. Representative McCormick. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, in the Appropriations Committee report, we adopted a few amendments to help provide technical support to local governments to define and clarify underground natural gas storage and added language to consider ozone mitigation if needed. I urge an I report, an I report. Okay, an I vote on the Appropriations Committee report. Thank you. Before we move the, or adopt the Appropriations Committee report, are your amendments to the bill or to the report? To the bill. The to bill, the, wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question before us is the adoption of the Appropriations Committee report to SB 23285. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The Appropriations Committee report to SB 23-285 is adopted. 
to the bill. Representative McCormick. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to move, I uh, know, nope, I'm not gonna say that. I move L029 to Senate Bill 285 and ask that it be dis displayed. SB, um, the L029 to SB 23285 has been properly moved and is properly displayed. Representative McCormick. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the bill, there was a section of the bill that describes uh, geothermal wells, and this amendment refers to adding the word deep geothermal wells because there's a difference between geothermal wells up to 2,500 feet and then those that go deeper than 2,500 feet. So we needed to make sure that we had deep geothermal wells. In the bill, in that section, I urge an I vote on this amendment. Thank you. Is there a further discussion on L029? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L029 to SB 23285. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no? L029 is adopted. Uh, to the bill, Representative McCormick. I move L033 to Senate Bill 285 and ask that it be displayed. Thank you. L033 has been moved and is properly displayed. Representative McCormick. Thank you, Madam Chair. L033 um, was brought to our attention by our wonderful drafters, um, letting us know that we need to ha have conforming language in this bill with Senate Bill 16 so that they were all talking to each other in a way that was uh, where they could understand each other, these two bills. So this is a conforming language amendment. I urge an, urge an I vote. Um, thank you. Is there further discussion on L033? Seeing none, the Thank you. L028 has been moved and is properly displayed. Representative Dixon, please tell us about your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. L028 essentially adds a definition to the discussion in the bill of waste with regards to geothermal and specifically deep geothermal, and we ask for an I vote. Okay. Um, the question before us, uh, or is there any further discussion on L028? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L028 to SB 23285. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. L028 is adopted. To the bill, Representative Dixon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move amendment L20 to SB 285 and ask that it be displayed. Thank you. L020 has been moved and is properly displayed. Please tell us about your amendment, Representative Dixon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So this amendment and the following two amendments all clarify that the three reports that are set out in the bill, um, that they all should be presented to the relevant energy committee in both the House and the Senate, uh, just to make sure that there is regulatory oversight or legislative oversight of the regulatory process. So I ask for an I vote on this and the next two amendments. Thank you. Is there further discussion on L020? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L020 to SB 23285. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. L um, the ayes have it. L020 is adopted. To the bill, Representative Dixon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Amendment L31 to Senate Bill 285 and ask that it be displayed. L031 has been moved and is properly displayed. Um, please tell us about your amendment, Representative Dixon. This again uh, at, requires that the uh, agency report to our committees. I ask for an I vote. Is there further discussion on L031? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L031 to SB 23285. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. 
SB 20, um, S L031 is adopted. To the bill, Representative Dixon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Last one from us. I move Amendment L32 to SB 285 and ask that it be displayed. Thank you. L032 has been moved and is properly displayed. Please tell us about your amendment. Representative Dixon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, this just requires that the agency report to the legislator, legislature after they have completed their third of these three reports. I ask for an I vote. Wonderful. Um, seeing, uh, is there any further discussion on L032? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L032 to SB 23285. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. You guys sound like you're getting worn out from voting, just saying. Um, but L032 is adopted. Representative McCormick, to the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senate Bill 285 um, speaks to having us be able to expand regulatory authority and rename the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission to the Colorado Energy and Carbon Management Commission. Currently, the state lacks regulatory authority and oversight of these emerging technologies. And without this authority, Colorado is unable to regulate and take advantage of these emerging technologies in a manner that aligns with our state's goals and with our um, goal of protecting public health and environment. And securing our state authority in this space um, may create many new good paying jobs, also create um, another avenue for just transition in, uh, that we speak about so often down here um, and produce cleaner, more reliable energy, uh, reduce emissions and meet our state um, greenhouse and rene renewable energy goals in the energy sector. This gives us uh, a new avenue to look at new energies. Um, it does clear regulatory pathways for the safe deployment of subsurface and energy resources, specifically deep uh, geothermal operations I referred to uh, earlier. These are um, wells that are deeper than 2,500 feet. And the process of using heat in these deep subsurface formations to produce energy um, is for energy or for direct heating uses. And we have several basins in our state that span very large areas uh, with higher than normal temperatures in the subsurface. And this is an opportunity for us to take advantage of that incredible resource. Um, we also have, uh, want to look at the process of underground natural gas storage that we can, we're already doing, but this will um, give us that ability to kind of have that battery source uh, in natural gas when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining um, as we transition to some of these newer technologies. And um, it does also have in the bill these multiple studies that you um, heard about referenced in our amendments um, that will help us have information on pipelines and um, other things that we need to look at to see if there's any more regulatory um, things that we need to do here at the state legislature going forward. Uh, this is a really good bill. It is um, one that is supported across many different um, voices in our state. And it's a great opportunity for us to be a leader in the West, um, especially in the geothermal space. And I urge and I vote on Senate Bill 285. Representative Dixon. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a great bill. It's a result of extensive stakeholding between many different actors that I know all of you care about. And I ask for an I vote. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on SB 23285? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of SB 23285. Um, oh, all in favor, uh, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The ayes most definitely have it. SB 23285 is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, can you please read the title of SB 23014? Senate Bill 14 by Senator Moreno, also Representative Lindsay, concerning establishing the disordered eating prevention program in the Department of Public Health and Environment and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Thank you. Representative Lindsay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Senate Bill uh, 014. Thank you. To the bill. 
Thank you. Uh, Senate Bill 14 is another bill that has come out of the Youth, Colorado Youth Advisory Committee, which colleagues were just mentioning, which um, is a great program. Hugh McKean was a really big advocate of the program. I got to sit with him on the committee this past summer, and I'm very grateful um, for that time. This bill happens to be the last bill coming out of the COYAC uh, interim committee that's going through legislature. Um, it's a great bill. It creates the Disordered Eating and Prevention Program within the Department of Public Health and Environment to better understand risk factors, impacts, and inter interventions associated with disordered eating. In collaboration with the Office of Suicide Prevention, the Behavioral Health Administration, and the Department of Education, among other organizations, the program must provide resources and support to individuals, facilitate public outreach, increase awareness about prevention and care, and create culturally specific written materials for primary care offices and providers and across the state. Um, it's a great bill that's from Youth Voice, which I'm um, very determined to honor and do my best by these kids to um, listen to what they say and try to bring out change that helps them in their everyday lives. So I urge an I vote. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. This bill also came to Public Health Committee. Um, I, too, loved Hugh McKean. He was a very close friend of mine, a mentor and confidant. He and I had uh, parallel paths in 2022. It's just his path was cut short um, due to a very tragic situation. But I want to mention something about this bill um, that's problematic. And this is important, and oftentimes, you know, I'm the person that says things that need to be said, but people don't want to hear. So I'm going to start with that comment. And it's important that you understand that the uh, anorexia nervosa and the, and the bulimia problem has been around for decades, if not longer. 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010, 2020s, and beyond. Now, what this bill is doing is saying to our Koyak kids, come to us with your problems and government will solve them. At least that's the perception that I believe is given by this bill and that interim work and the actual appropriation of money to this particular effort. The comment I made in committee and the comment I'll make before this House chamber is that there are certain things and certain roles of government. There are certain things and certain roles that should not be a part of government. There's a reason why I voted against this in committee and will vote against it today and when it comes up on thirds. Number one, this is not going to solve the problem. This bill's not going to solve the problem. The work that the bill is going to promote is not going to solve the problem. And those youth are still going to have, and the youth of future time are still going to have this problem. My point, ladies and gentlemen, is as you look to government to solve every ill in society, you need to understand that government can't solve it all. And appropriating hundreds of thousands of dollars like this is not going to be money well invested in the future. So for that reason, I'll be a no. And I wasn't the only person that voted no in the committee. Representative Bradley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am also a no on this bill. I have too many questions about this bill. One being, we continue to grow government. And that is not the responsibility of us. We have grown government. Let's see all the new office. In the past four years, we have grown government, Office of Public Guardianship, Office of Colorado Resiliency, Office of Saving People Money on Healthcare, Office of Just Transition, Office of New Americans, Office of Insurance Ombudsman, Colorado Broadband Office, Office of Gun Violence Prevention, Office of Financial Empowerment, and more and more and more and more. I, I asked the bill sponsor, why aren't we putting this under the Suicide Prevention Office? Why do we need to create yet another office with two FTEs costing the government thousands of dollars. I, I just don't understand it. Um, I also don't understand 
how they're going to get this out into the community. And when I asked, they said they were planning to add three questions to the Healthier Kids Survey. A ton of parents opt their kids out of the Healthier Kids Survey. We feel like it's invasive. We feel like we don't understand the questions and parents are very concerned about this Healthier Kids Survey. I asked if there was another state that they had modeled this research on, and this is gonna be the first state, Colorado will be the first state that this is going to implement. So there's no parameters for success. There's no parameters on what we should be doing to establish it. We don't even know how we're getting it out. Getting it out. And then I'm also bothered about the outreach is going to affect impact the communities um, and really going after the LGBTQ and youth of color. If Colorado is the fifth highest eating disorder in the country, why are we only opening it up to a group of people? Because I think that eating disorders affect every person of every color, of every income capacity. And I don't think it's fair that we're just focusing on a group of people. I mean, what, what do we put up in the schools that these are the people that are affected with eating disorders and then how about people that look like me? Do we not get help for eating disorders? Um, I, I just have a, a really a hard time growing more government without any understanding of where it's going, what it looks like, no modeling. Um, and again, why we're not putting this in the suicide prevention office, if this is really a problem, it should be placed under there. So I urge a no vote on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bradfield. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am the last of the of our caucus to who is on the Public Health uh, Committee, and I too want to uh, uh, urge a no vote for this. Um, and I do believe uh, Representative Holtorf and uh, Bradley have pretty much said it all. Um, I'm okay with um, a high school group uh, cho of kids chosen from across the state to come up with ideas, but it's not their place to suggest legislation. And um, for that, uh, that is part of my no, but basically this is something we don't need. Thank you. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Um, Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Madam Chair. I share my colleague's concern that, uh, I mean, certainly with any form, I mean, this is just a form of body dysmorphia a lot of times with the eating disorders. There's a, uh, I, it's ironic that we're not just uh, handling them similarly. We have gifts, grants, and donations, which usually dry up. We have contracting with a third-party focus group to interview key individuals, conduct surveys, establish collaborative group to discuss issues uh, regarding eating. And what are we going to do as the uh, what are we going to do as the state? What is the state going to do about eating disorders? What do we do? I mean, what is what? Are, like my colleague said, what are the metrics for success here? If you're going to spend money on it, you should have some sort of metric. We have amount of each grant towards the uh, recipient, recipient reports, written reports to the division, following information. It really doesn't look like it. There, there are lots of places that are already studying this issue, and why would the uh, why would we need a government body? to figure out, to, to study it further. And you know whatever the, lo the length of program this is, it's not going to go away, so it's more that will need to be expended. It does come out of the revenue. It does come out of the taxation of the... Of the uh, there's just a lot of things that we, uh, as a government, should not be involved in. This is... This is the nanny state. This is the come to us, we will go to you and solve all of, our pro all of your problems. And why would you think of solving a problem on your own if you can have the state solve it? This is in the military, I think we would call this mission creep where you just continue to find more and more to do. It's not, that it's, it's not that studying this isn't a good idea, 
but we're extracting money from taxpayers for this good idea. And we need to be cognizant of that. We are continually worried about the impact of cost of living on our constituents, but the only thing that we're worried about is how much their landlord charges. We drive up their energy costs, we drive up their taxes with bills like this, the continuous onslaught of this kind of bill. So if we're going to be remotely fiscally responsible, I know those, those two words are anathema, but if we're going to be remotely fiscally responsible, we need to start prioritizing what we spend money on, not just spending money on things that sound good. Solving the eating disorder crisis would be great. I think that'd be fantastic for kids. The ability of the government to solve it, I'd say, falls in line with its ability to solve most anything else, and that is, that is very, very low. Because after this, when you have this, the purpose of this bill is to lead to another bill. And that, and that purpose of this little bit of taxation is to crack the nut on a bigger batch of taxation. There's going to be more offices, more responsibilities, more task force, more, more, more. And they all cost, cost, cost. So it's wafer thin. I get it. Vote no on this. Oh. We're doing an amendment or something. I don't know what we're doing. Create and maintain an external facing that is updated annually, annually, and includes key information. So annually, out years, 49,000 this year, 37,000 next year. This is updated annually. Must, face, must be culturally sensitive and available in both English and Spanish. Now, that's kind of interesting. There's a lot more languages than English and Spanish. Collaborate with the Office of Suicide Prevention. So we're saying that body dysmorphia is related to suicide. Partner with this Department of Education to inform teachers and administrate, administers and parents on disordered eating prevention. I am pretty sure there's lots of programs out there already that do this on the, on the free market that don't require that don't require government intervention. Government intervention. Now a lot of people after I've been in the military for 27 years say why would you be opposed to government intervention after you're in the military for 27 years? And I'd say that's it's because I was in the military for 27 years that I'm against government intervention. I see how few things the government does well. And when we start, and we start sliding, when we start sliding things like charity and mental health under the realm of the government, and it just becomes to take more and more, becomes more of a totality of our life and a more totality of the control of our lives, I think we need to be very careful. So we'll see what these amendments are, but right now I recommend a no vote on this for the mental health, for the fiscal health, and for the societal health of our state. Thank you, Representative Bradfield, Bradley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just, if this is the fifth, highest state for eating disorders in the country, I would just like to strike language that excludes people from that category. So with that, I would like to move Amendment L005 and ask that it be displayed. Thank you. L005 has been um, moved and is properly displayed. Please explain your amendment. Representative Bradley, please explain your amendment.
Representative Bradley, please explain your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. It just is striking language, so we incorporate anyone, and it supports Coloradans who develop disordered eating, period, end of sentence. That includes everyone. That includes minorities. It includes LGBTQ. It includes anyone and everyone who has an eating disorder. We need to protect these kids if we're the fifth highest in the country, and we need to not be exclusive to everyone who has problems with eating disorders. And I ask for an I vote, please. Representative Lindsay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, COYAC put a lot of thought and time into, the, into their priorities and how they wanted it to be, um, and I want to honor their language. This prevention program will be for everybody, but it was very important to these students that the bill is like this, so I would urge a no vote on this amendment. Thank you. Uh, Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's interesting that for a, and our Constitution does preclude Treating, in, treating different groups separately, and that we should all be, like if we're gonna get over having groups specially recognized, at some point we just gotta stop recognizing groups specially and stop dividing, dividing our, our nation up into uh, in what's called balkanizing the, balkanizing the country. You can't, Contrary to popular belief, you can't solve racism with racism. That doesn't work. It just creates war. So if this is so important to recognize, it is also important to recognize that disordered eating harms and increases the mortality rate. But the sponsor just said that this really has nothing to do with the bill. And if you go to the first page, if you go to the first page, it specifically says people of color, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender individuals, youth, and older Coloradans. So those are some very specific. So you have the old, you have the young, and then you have everything around. Why, I don't know why we just don't say not white, not white middle ages, not white between 20 and 50. You could just say not white between, not white and straight between 20 and 50. I mean, that's what we're saying here, is that this program, although it applies to everybody in that category, it's not as important, but it's gonna cover them, but we need to specifically annotate that some people are more prone towards this mental, this mental disorder. So, it's just interesting. We do this with the, uh, with the climate bills. We put a bunch of climate nonsense in there. And then here we put a bunch of ideological, we insert, we insert a bunch of, uh, of ideology into the bills that are supposed to treat Coloradans equally. Our Constitution requires took special pains to put in the Constitution that we need to treat people equally, and then we create legislation that specifically attempts and, and actually succeeds in treating people differently. So when the Constitution was formed, it was formed under the idea of treating people equally. When we get to our progressive legislation, we all of a sudden want to start dividing people into groups. We want to start subdividing our culture. We want to start telling every, we want to start focusing on everybody's differences. That's what we're doing. We're focusing on people's differences. Are we talking about people or are we talking about people of color, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender? individuals, youth, or older Coloradans, because this part right here says that these, these people are more prone. I guess when you get to be in this middle category and you happen to be white, then you're, or whatever color we consider white, is somehow exempt from this. I, so I don't, I don't get it. We're, we're, we're specially carving out and we're calling out individuals on, and then we're putting it under a category of essentially a, a disorder, a, a mental disorder, and then, we're, and then we're specifically calling out and identifying a group. I mean, that in itself, to me, is problematic. 
We don't really, again, we don't really know what we're going to achieve with this. We don't know what we're looking to achieve with this. We haven't, we haven't indicated any, any measures of success other than spending money and feeling good about spending money. There, there really needs to be a better, like there's not, I don't even see, maybe, maybe I'm wrong here, but maybe because we're covering so many bills so rapidly, but maybe I'm wrong that like we want to lower the eating disorder rate by this much, by a percentage, by something measurable because otherwise this program is going to go on ad infinitum, which is standard for a government program because there is nothing so no permanent as a temporary government program. That has proved itself time and time again. So if you want to actually start moving towards treating people equally, then we should probably start treating them equally as was put in our Constitution going on 150 years ago. Instead of trying to continually divide the country into different, into different groups. So I ask for a yes vote on this amendment. I don't know why this was so care when you when you say that this language was so carefully crafted when this when divisive language is so carefully crafted into a, a bill, I think we need to be I think we need to be concerned about why divisive language was so carefully crafted into a bill. I ask for a yes vote on this amendment. Thank you, Representative Bradley. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I agree with the representative from El Paso. I don't understand why this is such a contentious amendment. If we're trying to take care of Coloradans who are having a problem with disordered eating, and we had just told that Koyak, so kids, are putting laws into statute, which is mind-boggling to me because I thought that that's what we were here to do. Um, all we're doing is saying educate Coloradans on the severity of disordered eating, prevent disordered eating in Colorado, and support Coloradans who develop disordered eating, period. End of sentence. There's no reason to add on to that. We are the fifth highest state for eating disorders. And I have research that says white women have an increased risk for anorexia. I'm not asking that you include that. I'm asking that we include all people, men and women, and anyone else that suffers from eating disorders, to be included and to feel part of this law impacts them and that we're trying to help anyone in Colorado that is affected by this. It's a simple amendment that strikes anything else but that we are going to give help to those people in Colorado who are suffering from disordered eating. We don't have any statistics. We're just listening to what the COYAC says and the bill sponsors say that this does increase the mortality rate. We don't have statistics on that. We don't have any evidence backing it up. And older Coloradans, is it because they don't get food? Is it because they can't afford food? Is it because they pick medication over food? Is it because they pick the cost of living over food? There's no evidence. All I'm asking for is to put a period and support Coloradans who develop disordered eating. End of sentence. So that it's fair for everyone that has an eating disorder. And I urge an I vote. Thank you. Thank you, Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think part of my problem goes back to this first sentence in that the General Assembly finds and declares that. The General Assembly declares, I mean, we haven't been presented with evidence as to this fact, so we might as well be declaring. We're declaring out of whole cloth, as far as I can tell, that people of color, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or L uh, transgender individuals are more likely to suffer from disordered eating, but less likely to receive eating disorder treatment, creating disproportionate gap, disproportionate gap in eating disorder prevention and care. And the General Assembly declares that it is important to recognize that disordered eating harms and increases mortality rate. If this was a paper I was grading, I'd say that is, a, that is redundant. You've already said it. Um, so there's a reason that it's saying it twice besides bad grammar. Um, and the, 
the bigger problem is these type bills go into something else where next year it'll be like last year, the General Assembly found that this to be true. Well, we haven't been any presented with any evidence that this is true. We haven't been presented with any evidence, and so we're just going to declare it. So that makes sense because it says declares instead of finds because we, don't, we haven't been presented with evidence other than just whatever the, whatever the organization, I don't remember what it is, declared, COYAC, said that it was true. So, so what we're doing repeatedly, a general theme of our bills is we're just, we're inserting ideology low on facts. I mean, if there's facts behind this, I'd like to see them. I haven't seen them that we want because otherwise we're not finding, we're not, the General Assembly is not finding that. The General Assembly is not weighing evidence between why, why white middle class women suddenly don't have eating disorders. What we're, fi we're not finding that people that, I guess this is what, BIPOC now, lesbian, gay, bi we're not finding that, we're just declaring that. So I guess it is fitting that whatever the agency is, again, I'm sorry, I forgot it again. I don't want to say it wrong, so I'd rather not say it. So that they are putting words in our mouth and we are declaring that. The, 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 the General Assembly is declaring that. And then that can be used in the next year, in 2023, the General Assembly declared that this was a problem, therefore we need to create a solution. If it's, if it's a problem, then we need to have a solution. So otherwise we'd have to go back and say, well, it wasn't really a problem after all. So this is, this is leading towards a solution. It's leading towards, I'd say, a predetermined solution. It's probably leading towards a costly solution. It is, it's not scientific. It's not scientifically presented. It's not scientifically based. It's not good grammar. So I recommend an I vote. And maybe, maybe let's tighten up the bills and treat all Coloradans like Coloradans instead of special little funnels of individuals that, we ha that we're treating differently and we're carving out separately for separate pots of money. And we're putting in different categories when we're saying we don't want to categorize people and then we categorize people. Let's start treating Coloradans like Coloradans because we're spending their money. If you want to have an eating disorder program, have an eating disorder program, but don't, don't specially carve out a small group of people. I recommend an I vote on this amendment for science, grammar, lots of reasons. Is there any further discussion on L005? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L005 to SB 23014. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. Aye. The no's have it. L005 fails. To the bill. Is there any further discussion on SB 23014? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of SB 014. All in favor, please say aye. All opposed, no. no. SP 014 is as amended, or as not amended, <laughs> is adopted. Okay, Mr. Schiebel, can you please read the title of SB 230199? Senate Bill 199 by Senator Senrickson and Van Winkle, also Representatives Lindstedt and Weinberg, concerning procedures for the issuance of marijuana licenses in connection with, clarifying that the state licensing authority may refund licensing fees when the application is denied and allowing applicants the opportunity to renew a state license with local jurisdiction approval while local jurisdiction approval is pending. Excuse me. Thank you. Um, Representative Lindstad. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I move the Finance Committee Report. Um, thank you um, to the, the com Committee Report. Uh, in the and could, could you remove the bill at the same time, please? Yep. And SB 199. 
Okay, to the committee report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in committee, we appropriate, well, we found some money um, in a line item in DOR to fund the refund process and ran an amendment to do that. And I have another amendment here to clean up that amendment from a typo. So. Okay, so the amendment is to the committee report. I move Amendment L004 and ask that it be displayed. Thank you. L004 has been moved and is now properly displayed. Please tell us about it. Representative Winstead. As you can see, it is uh, about the most complex amendment we, we can get here on the floor. It changes the number three to four. <laughs> I ask for an I vote. Um, thank you. Any further discussion on L004? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L004 to SB 23199. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. L004 is adopted. To the committee report. Um, seeing no further discussion on the finance committee report. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The Finance Committee report is adopted. To the bill, Representative Weinberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is a privilege to serve with you. And it is a privilege to serve with you. <laughs> Fellow colleagues, this is a pro-business bill that prevents applications from having to jump through unnecessary hoops. Current law requires a, mar a marijuana license applicant to obtain both a state license and local jurisdiction approval. The state license is conditioned on local jurisdiction the bill provides an applicant the opportunity to renew for up to one year a state license that would otherwise expire because of failure to receive local jurisdiction approval if the applicant demonstrates good cause. This bill was unanimous out of the Senate and, ha and as a fiscal conservative, government deregulation on business is always a good practice. I urge and I vote. Thank you. Representative Lindstedt? No. Okay, um, is there further discussion on L0 or SB 23199? Uh, All in favor of SB 23199, please say, oh, as amended, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, please say no. no. SB 23199 is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, can you please read the title of SB 23259? Senate Bill 259 by Senators Robertson Baisley, also Representatives Weinberg and Snyder, concerning the extension of credit for participation in limited gaming. Thank you. Representative Snyder. Thank you, Madam Chair. And what an honor it is to serve with you. And what an honor it is to serve with you, Representative Snyder. Thank you, Madam Chair. And with that, I move Senate Bill 259. Excellent. To the bill. So 259 Snyder. is a, this is a very well stakeholded bill. So this worked its way through the Senate. It got unanimous support in the Senate Business Committee. I don't have the exact number, but a large majority voted it through over to the House Finance Committee. It passed nine to two in House Finance. There are a lot of safeguards and protections. This is a courtesy bill, a convenience bill. It's a tourism bill. It's allowing, it's really trying to attract uh, folks that want to play, that want to gamble, want to go to Cripple Creek or Black Hawk or Central City in Colorado, gives them the opportunity ahead of time to apply for credit with the casino. And there's a full vetting process. They go through your full credit check. They make sure you have, an, have any other outstanding lines of credit with any casinos that, that give credit here in the country. Uh, there's a full check, make sure you don't owe anything like child support, no judgment liens. And, a crim and criminal record. So on the front end, there's a lot of protections. So if you get this credit, if you don't have a good streak, you end up owing some money, you have 150 days to pay that back. No interest assessed at any time in this process. So really, it's a, it's a convenience for people. It's used in very limited circumstances. It's something that the casinos feel will help them to build and maintain customer base, so I would humbly ask for your support for Senate Bill 259. Thank you, Representative Weinberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, fellow colleagues, again, another good bill. We were brought forth this by doing a lot of stakeholdering. 
This will bring industry for the gambling community in Colorado, give a better chance for people to have an opportunity to literally go in and go hard. I think after all of the stakeholding we've done through the past couple of weeks on this one, this is a good bill and I would drive it. Um, thank you. Um, Representative, are, are you guys done? Because Representative Holtorf, I believe, would like to have a word. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want the bill sponsors to kind of um, stay close here because I'm really struggling with something, and I, I, I spoke with the bill sponsors before this bill was introduced. And I really have a concern about the top end of the credit spectrum. Now, when people are gambling, it's not like they're going to get a mortgage for a house, they're trying to buy a car, um, they're borrowing for appliances or furniture or some other consumer good. They're gambling. And it, I really struggle with credit limits on gambling because that means if you're having to borrow money to gamble, that means you already spent the money you had to spend on gambling and now you're wanting to get in the game without any money. So I'm going to offer this amendment and I'm going to ask the bill sponsors to explain to me why we shouldn't adopt this amendment. Nothing new in the chamber, but I just, <clears throat> if they can convince me, I will withdraw this amendment. But I'm really struggling with this one, so Madam Chair, I'm going to offer Amendment L016 to Senate Bill 259 and ask that it be displayed. Okay. Would you like to move it as well? I will. And in that offering now, ma'am, I'm going to so move L016 to Senate Bill 259 and ask that it properly be displayed. And then I'll explain the amendment, and then I think the bill sponsors are going to want to come in here and explain some things to me, I believe. Okay, L016 has been moved and is properly displayed. Please explain your amendment, Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. So what my concern is in this limited gaming space or this gaming space in Colorado is... If someone is gambling and then they want to ask for credit to gamble, should the sky be the limit? Should somebody's credit score be the determinant? Should their financial statement or their balance sheet or their asset collateral obligations that they might offer to the house, should that be um, analyzed and then offered as collateral or some type of collateralization because um, I'm really concerned and so what I think about and, and I'm not a gambler and I'm not a big gambler I'm in agriculture in the cattle business I don't need to go anywhere to gamble I do it every day um, so I just want to know if there should be a top that protects those people and if so then this amendment would allow for that top thank if you representative Weinberg Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the statement made by my fellow colleague is actually incorrect. You cannot get this credit limit on the floor. This is an application that you have to put in advance. I hope that convinces you. And, Thank you, Representative Snyder. Thank you, Madam Chair. And yeah, uh, my, my co-prime sponsor is correct there. This is uh, something that needs to be set up in advance this is a convenience for people, primarily people from out of state. If they want to come and they have a limit of, say, $10,000 is the amount that they're prepared to gamble and risk losing, we don't want them traveling with that cash and, and uh, having that expense. If they can have this credit set up, but you have to realize how vigorous this credit is on the front end. You know, as I said, there's a full credit report. There is any outstanding debt for child support. Um, you know, other checks on there for, for criminal activity or judgment liens or what have you. Um, also realize the casinos, it would not be in their benefit to lend money to extend credit to people that are not credit worthy. The c casinos will be paying the full casino gambling tax, which is, in, which is not inconsiderable 
already. So they're, they have skin in the game. They're going to do this right. And I appreciate the amendment, but I would ask for a no vote. Representative Holtor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to withdraw my motion for L016. Uh, thank you. Representative um, DeGraff. I'll put it back down for you. Don't worry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. All right. So I'm not 100% sure on these as well, but trying to get some research on here. Here's some paperwork on it. After filing out a casino marker application, you can be offered a certain amount of money worth of money markers, even though your bank account doesn't contain that much money. You don't worry about it because you only plan on using a couple thousand dollars. Your luck has to turn at some point. And this is a paper that's printed out by uh, Amy's law, Almay's Law, and it's there's probably some, I'm sure there's some differences in here because I think this is around Vegas law, which is not the same because that's a, that is a, uh, that has criminal penalties where this specifically has civil penalties, which I think is, I think it's worth, I think it's worth noting up front that this one, the civil penalties, and that's, I think that's important. I'm really glad I saw that in there. Casino markers are generally defined as short term, no interest credit lines because extended by casinos. In reality, however, the, ex the explanation is extremely misleading because gambling institutions treat these markers as credit. The patron must, so to the bill, the patron must complete a credit application asking for such information as uh, name, social security number, and complete bank account information. Once approved, the gambler can request a marker for a specific amount, which is then printed in the cage of the pit. Now, what I heard from the sponsors, however, is that can't, this can't be done on the floor. It has to be done in advance. So I want to make sure that we have the differences uh, as we go. Interest-free, provided that the borrower repays them within the specified period of time. After 30 days of non-payment, the casino attempts to withdraw from the bank account on the, on the credit application. If the money isn't available, then the gaming required is to. So then you, then you, set, the, uh, you set the repayment process in, in motion. Here's why I think it's important that it's civil, that casino markers are short-term interest credit line in gaming. Uh, if the marker bounces for insufficient funds, then the casino will send a certified letter with a notice of refusal for payment. Would that be the same in this case? Okay. In Nevada, it's a misdemeanor up to $1,200. Above $1,200, it's a class D felony. Here, it's civil. It's only civil. It's only civil, which is really important, and I'd be worried about that getting changed later because it gets really expensive for the state to start uh, being the credit enforcer for the... Uh, for these institutions, and I'm, so I'm very glad that's in there. Uh, there are, these do have, in this case, Louisiana's Second Circuit holds Shreveport Casino enforceable against te Texas gamblers, and that allows them to be extradited. Or, um, so the, the bigger problem on this, like according to the Atlantic, is that Casinos enable gambling addicts. Modern slot machines develop an unbreakable hold on some players, some who wind up losing their jobs, families, and even, in the case of Scott Stevens, their lives. In the morning, Stacy thought he was off to a job interview. He drove 22 miles from home. He used his casino ATM to check his bank account balance, 13400 He walked across the street to the favorite slot machines. And maybe this would pay enough to save him. He didn't in the next four hours burning through $13,000 from his account until he had only $4,000 left. Around noon, he gave up, wrote a five-page letter to his uh, wife, and then it goes on. She deposited $4,000 moving into check. So um, I don't want to go through a bunch of stuff just reading it. Um, Massacre of a family linked to uh, gambling, $225,000 in shredded casino markers. Gentleman who secured eight casino markers totaling $625,000 between 2016 and 2017 that the banks say there was, uh, the casinos say was never returned.
Casinos obviously want their money back, and being in Las Vegas, uh, Las Vegas has the criminal statutes, and I think it's very important to note that this does not have criminal statutes, because that would get very important. That would, a research paper from uh, Mississippi School of Law on this, and that these, these markers can be a very detrimental. And part of the problem is if they are, if they are set too low, what it does is it enables the people that can't afford it. Because the lower the level of credit that is available, the more likely that individual is to be approved for that credit. Right? The, more, the, lower the, the lower the credit line, the more likely they are to be approved for the credit. So we have $1,000, which is a very low bar for entry. And there are good reasons for having this. Traveling with cash was mentioned by the sponsors. If somebody's going to gamble $10,000, they don't have to travel with $10,000 because that creates risk. And if they're caught with that much money, then somebody thinks they're dealing drugs, and then they confiscate the money, and then we get into civil asset forfeiture. And there should be a bill on that next year that everyone will like. So shameless plug, shameless plug. All right. but. We want to, we want to, we do want to enable the industry. It is here. The problem gambling of coalition. Now it does say, it does note here, I have a note here that it says the problem gambling coalition of Colorado is neutral on this, but it's noted on this note that it is a, this is not necessarily true because their mission is to educate, not advocate. So a neutral, I think the point there is that a neutral they, they would be neutral on everything. So to say that the Problem Gambling Coalition hasn't taken a stance on it means that they have just maintained their proper neutrality. So, um, so anyways, just in order to set some guardrails around this, and so I'm taking it, it's a different tack than my, my colleague. I know a lot of places, and I think the Senate tried to do 10,000, and then they tried 7,500. And the reason for that is to not to, um, not to impinge on anybody, but for the same reasons that we set speed limits. We set speed limits in order to regulate and to, and to actually help preserve life, uh, life uh, and property. And so for that reason, I would like to move L020 to SB259 and ask that it be improperly displayed, sideways, upside down, something. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have to hand it to him, don't I? Here I have the whole package. I thought I'd already given it to him. That's a Weinberg move. For Lublin. <laughs> yeah, perfect, perfect. I just wanted to see if I could do that. I would like it now properly displayed. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. L020 has been moved and is properly displayed. Please explain your amendment, Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is just to re-engross the page, page five, the re-engross bill, page five, 919, strike out one and substitute 10. The reason for this is to establish some guardrails around the procedure, around the process, and around the people, because we want to actually move the credit limit up to make it more, it does make it more difficult for somebody to get a line of credit. If somebody's coming in from out of state and they are gonna be traveling with large amounts of cash, this would still apply to them. The, uh, in, in some places, as I understand it, it's $25,000. That way it's applicable to large, uh, like big gamers because it's gonna, it's gonna go in 30 days, it's gonna be applied to their bank account and, they, and they're gonna need to make sure that they have this in their bank account. So what this $10,000 does is it, it will, in fact, restrict some of the people, it will, in fact, restrict some of the people in Colorado from getting this. And, most, and, and it's meant to restrict the people with, on the, uh, with gambling addiction. It's meant, it is meant to be a barrier to entry for people with a gambling problem to not have a, as easy an access to the cr line of credit. And then this would, 
this would make it so that the, uh, they would have to have a higher level of qualification to prove that they can lose the money because the, ultimately the House always wins. So just in putting some guardrails around this, this doesn't eliminate the practice, but it does put some guardrails around it. Right now, the barrier to entry is too low, and it $1,000, most everybody's going to be able to qualify that for that, and they can get themselves into some serious, serious gambling debt very quickly by being able to get into this. So $10,000 does not preclude the big rollers that we're talking about not having to carry large amounts of cash from out of state. It doesn't, it doesn't preclude the big rollers from carrying, having to carry $10,000 in state. What it does is it just keeps the low-level gambling addicts from accessing too much credit to their detriment and losing money. Now, the, the gambling institutions, I know, will want it at the lower level because these are lucrative. Because if somebody gets a gambling credit, they are ultimately going to gamble away all that money they are going to gamble away all that money. So the gambling institutions are going to want this because it is the lower the bar, the more profitable the, the, the chip because it applies to everybody. But what we're doing is we're trying to establish some boundaries on here to help the people that can't help themselves. So I recommend an I vote on this amendment so that we can so that we can, uh, so that I can stop talking and uh, we can get on with this and we can protect the citizens of Colorado. So $10,000 to protect the citizens of Colorado. Representative Weinberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. To, the, to my colleagues, We are not understanding this bill. I can clearly see my colleague has not read it. <laughs> uh, to come down here and say literally that there is no credit limit and anybody can be given any amount possible is not true. You have to go through a credit score. You have to go through a background check with it. It's and in advance of getting to the casino. A $10,000 cap is going to prevent members that are of a higher limit. The main premise of this bill is very simple. Multiple states have conducted this and have these rules in order and in place. It is not being taken advantage of. You have the division of gaming and the protections around gambling addictions in neutral. You cannot walk into a casino and request a line of credit. This is an in advance limit. If somebody wants to go in and request $100,000, they have to do it in advance, get background checks, go through some systems. Talk about safety and guardrails. This is the whole reason for the bill. This is a guardrail and a safety. You cannot walk into a casino and say, I would love $100,000. Put me in debt for the rest of my life, please. They will refuse you. It doesn't work that way. The bill as written is copying good legislation from the rest of the country, which is currently working. This topic is not in the news. People are not going broke. We have to take that into concern. The bill as currently written is a good bill which will bring revenue and Tabor dollars to the citizens in this state from out-of-state people. That is what we need to focus on. The casinos have this for a reason. They would like this implemented for a reason. And instead of any type of rhetoric of hurting the good citizens of Colorado, flip it around and say this is going to benefit. The people walking into the state, they're going to spend the money and drop the, the dollars in that casino, only benefits my colleague 
myself, and people in Loveland. It is very important to recognize that. This is a good bill. It increases our TABA fund. It increases our tax revenue to the state. And I would urge a no on this amendment. Um, Representative Bottoms, are you speaking to the amendment? Please. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is, uh, the, from what they understand this amendment, this is not like the earlier amendment that put a cap on it. What this does is this puts a minimum to it. Um, and so what we're saying is, and I, and I agree with this amendment, what we're saying, if I'm understanding this amendment correctly, and the amendment um, guy can attest to this, but we're saying if, if you're in that category where you can be qualified for $1,000, um, I'm not talking about how far you can go after that. I'm saying just up to that $1,000. If you're in the category where you can be um, qualified for the $1,000, I think it's preying on, potentially preying on a, a group of people that, um, that would fall within that category and, and quickly get caught up in the debt of this. Now, the reason that I am... I am much more, I am about individual decision and all this kind of stuff. I don't like state control or anything, but this is an addiction that we're talking about. This is potentially um, people with addictions. And, and you walk into a gambling hall, any of those, any kind of gambling, any kind of anything, this is, most of those people there have issues and addictions. So then what we're saying is, this category, we're going to let them up to $1,000, we're going to do that. I think if you raise that up, you eliminate uh, a lot of people that have already hurt themselves through gambling down to a specific place financially that maybe they weren't at earlier, but they fall into this because of the addictive nature. And so if you raise the, the minimum, not, not, not discussing the maximum, but if you raise the minimum, I think you cut out a lot of people that, that potentially are going to be much more susceptible because they have come from somewhere and have arrived at this uh, place uh, financially. And so I think if we're not careful, and I don't think, I don't think the amendment is, is, I mean, I don't think the bill is set up to do this, but the amendment potentially stops that, that um, enabling the addictive, the addiction side of this is potentially what I, I am speaking to. So I do urge an I vote for this amendment. Representative Snyder. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I guarantee you, if, there, if the Gamblers Anonymous and the, gambling, the Problem Gambling Coalition that was referenced earlier, if they saw this bill as being a potential problem to increase addiction possibilities for people, they would have let us know throughout this entire stakeholding process. We have gotten nothing like that from any of these organizations. Yes, there is a problem some people have with gambling, but this bill does not encourage those to be worse. Don't forget that if you've been to a casino floor, guess what's prominently displayed right off the floor? ATM machines. ATM machines where you can put your credit card in there and they will be able to pull out 500, who knows how much cash. That's a problem. That's not being checked by anybody. Credit cards come in the mail every day. My 23-year-old daughter gets three or four of them a day. That's an issue that needs to be addressed, but that is not even relevant to this bill. This credit program has great safeguards in it, and, and frankly, I respect my colleagues, but it seems to me that they're putting their own judgment in the place of people making their own decisions. What I'm really hearing is doing a little patting on the hand with people. It's like, aren't you sweet? But you really don't have the wherewithal to make your own decisions with your own money, and so we're gonna make those decisions for you. I'm really a, not a fan. I ask you strongly to vote no for this amendment. Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, in no me way mean to be uh, patting or patronizing to, uh, to anybody, but in this uh, the paper by uh, law school, Mississippi Law School, 
Uh, talks about Ms. Stevens did not fully comprehend the extent of her husband's addiction until three police officers showed up at her front door with the news of his death. He had gambled and embezzled over $4 million in the last few years. Between three and four million Americans are pathological gamblers. So they're considered pathological gamblers. Now, one of the agencies that uh, my colleague mentioned uh, maintains a neutral stance, and I'm not sure on the other ones. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure on the. Uh, I was not there for the stakeholding process. So what this is intended to do is to is to help keep some of the people who are pathological gamblers from being exploited by, by an, a relative, if the, if the line of credit is too easy, then they, and it is in the news, Las, Las Vegas strip casino secured eight, eight casino markers, you know, totaling 625,000 between 2016 and 2017. It is, it's not in the news here. Massacre of family is linked to gambling, 225,000 in shredded casino markers. Casino, casinos enabling addict, gambling addicts uh, in the Atlantic. Talking about uh, Louisiana second court, circuit court, upholding casino markers as enforceable against a Texas gambler. So we don't have any, I mean, we don't have, as far as I know, we don't have these markers right now. So of course it's not gonna be in the news. I remain encouraged that it is a civil penalty so we don't have to discuss the problems of, but we do, there is an enforcement, there is an impact to the state, there is, now we're talking about money that's drained, or that's, that will come back in, and that, I suppose that's true. But we're also talking about people that'll be exploited it, pathological gamblers, if you give them an easy path, if we give them an easy path to, to enable their pathological gamblers, we are gonna get more of that. We're gonna have the problems associated with that. So we're not talking about getting rid of the program. We're not saying it's a bad program. I'm not saying that it is improperly written. There are, I, I, there are other state, there are, I think there are like other, 17 other states doing this. So this does not stop people from engaging in this. It just stops people that don't have the means of, and they don't have the, uh, and they don't have the funds. So they, it has to be extended because if you have a low level, if you have a low level one thousand dollars that somebody can spend, the, that that's a very little, that's a very low risk, that's a very low risk loan. To the, so if they do lose it, it's not a big deal. But they, they stand to gain on every other person that is in there. So there is a, there's a perverse incentive for the, uh, for the casino to extend these lines of credit. So that with this perverse incentive, they can say, well, we're going to, I mean, and, and, and relatively low-level low risk. And because they're going to get the $1,000 back, so ultimately, what happens? Why would a casino not lend somebody money? If the casino lends you $1,000 out of the air, and then they, and you lose that $1,000, the casino didn't lose anything. If, they, if you win the $1,000 back, the casino gets their $1,000 and everybody walks away. But if you lose that money and don't repay it, the casino is in the exact same spot it was before. So the casino only has a positive, the casino only has a positive stake in this because it's a, it's a win-win, or it's a win-neutral. They either get the thousand dollars or more from the individual, or if the individual loses the money and doesn't repay it, then the bank, then the casino is exactly the place it was before. So they have an incentive to extend this line of credit to people who would not otherwise be qualified. And so if you raise that line of credit and make it a minimum of $10,000, now it is a higher bar for somebody to qualify with the checks and balances that are in this bill. 
There are checks and balances in this bill. This just makes it a higher, makes it a higher bar. It discourages, it makes it so that these type of loans are only going to be offered to people that can't afford it, that aren't getting themselves in a bind. So this does not eliminate the program. This just helps rein in the people that are going to be affected. If you, if, if you just tell, the, if you just tell the, the, the casinos that they can loan out $1,000, they can't possibly lose. The only thing that the casinos can do on that loan is win. Then the casinos have the incentive, I would say a perverse incentive, to loan that $1,000 to as many people as possible. That is a very wide net. And so when you, loan, when you have that very wide net that is extended to too many people who, don't, who might qualify financially because it's a very low bar to qualify for it financially, they might qualify for it financially, but they don't qualify for it on so many other levels. So this is just a bar that makes it a little bit, that, that kind of fo helps focus the bill on who it's meant for, for the high rollers that are coming in from out of state, some places I think it's $25,000. It's meant to just, it's just meant to, it's meant to be a filter. This is not a block. This does not preclude the program. This just puts some guardrails on that to, so that we can help prevent people in our community that are pathological gamblers from going down a, a road that will ultimately cost the citizens of Colorado in, in so many ways, in crime, in broken families, in, in uh, criminal, in, in, in any prosecution. So just, just asking that we raise, we put the floor at $10,000, create a somewhat, of, create a mild filter, keep, and with inflation, that, that $10,000 means less and less, but keep, keep people that do not, that cannot afford it, mentally or financially, keep them out of the easy line of credit where they can get themselves into a really big bind. I recommend an I vote on this, not in a coddling sense, but in a, in a, in a protective sense to preserve the, the, uh, the health and safety of our community. Thank you. Is there further, any further discussion on L020? Uh, L020, seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of L020. Oh, Representative Snyder, did you wish to speak to it? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just uh, strongly urge a no vote on this amendment. It, I, I realize the intent and the altruism here, but I, I just strongly believe that we are not, we should not be in the business of telling people how to s spend their own money when they have to go through all these hoops and qualify for this ability. So I ask for a no vote. Uh, Representative Ricks. Please vote yes. Thank you. And um, the question before us is the adoption of SB 23259, um, L020 to that bill. Um, I'll see, oh, further discussion, Representative, okay. Seeing no further discussion on L020, the question before us is the adoption of L020 to SB 23259. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no? No. The noes have it. Um, L020 fails. To the bill, uh, Representative Snyder. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we've had a lot of discussion here and I really appreciate that. There's a little section I wanna read to you if you're worried that there's something untoward or some hidden way that their casino is gonna make money. Uh, first, I wanna tell you also that casinos have to pay all of the taxes associated with all of the bets and wagering that's made and so they'll already have skin in the game. And whether or not they recover the money that has been credited or not, that tax is paid and due. And also, there's a, on page five of the bill, it clearly says, lenders shall comply with a uniform commercial credit code, articles one to nine of title five. That is the protections that are in there to make sure that there's nothing untoward. This is not a rent to own type of scheme or something else where they try to get you enrolled into the plan with hidden interest and hidden fees and all that type of stuff. And by the end of the time you buy a thousand dollar couch and it costs you $3,500, that's not a possibility here, folks. 
we have a, a casino industry that has had their ups and downs, and they were under very limited uh, table stakes and other things that has not allowed them to grow on and to, uh, to build a customer base and a client base. We are not, and nor do we ever want to be Las Vegas or Nevada. That, you know, they have a much different scheme out there. They have criminal codes. They got, frankly, people named, you know, from Vineland, New Jersey that will come out and help you find your wallet, that type of thing, okay? <laughs> This is not it. This is a good industry for Colorado, a good segment of our tourism. They've chosen this amount because that's how they think is the best way they can build this type of a quality program as a convenience. I would ask for a yes vote on Senate Bill 259. Sponsors, do you want to continue making your comments? I know there are further people who wish to discuss the bill. Um, are you wanting to make your final comments before they discuss the bill? Or would you like them to finish discussing the bill? Representative Ricks. No, there were more people. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> Representative Ricks. I move L015 to SB 259, and I ask that it be properly displayed. Thank you. L015 has been moved and is properly displayed. Please tell us about your amendment. Members, this amendment is to set the minimum allowed extension of credit to $3,000, which is important to protect individuals who struggle with gambling addictions. It is easy to get caught up in a casino environment, hoping your luck will turn around. These markers do take advantage of the scenario. An individual plans a trip to Black Hawk, one of these gaming towns in Colorado, gets approved for a line of credit beforehand. They are a frequent player with a player's card, so the casino knows that they spend a certain amount of money and they have been approved to do their good background check, but they already plan to spend $500, so they have $500 cash that they bring up to the casino. Unfortunately, they lost the $500, and now they go get their pre-approved extension of credit of $1,000. But as we know, the house always wins, and they lose that as well. The casino has made the original $500, but, and now they have money from the credit that they have extended and still needs to be repaid by this, this borrower or this gambler. So they're going to win three times off the backs of gamblers. You know, the question is, should casinos be borrowing money to somebody to gamble? I mean, you know, yes, I understand high rollers, and, you know, those are people who may not carry $10,000 briefcases around with them. But for a person who can qualify for $1,000, that's probably like the average person, low to middle income people who don't typically have a lot of money. And it may sound good because you have, a, you know, predisposal to gambling and you have already spent that $500 and you're thinking, man, I know those sevens were coming around. All I need to do is to pull the level one more time and I'm gonna hit gold. But we know that the house is gonna win on you. And so they're gonna be stuck. After 150 days of not being able to pay this $1,000 uh, that they borrowed, they're now in debt. What happens then? According to the bill, it says that when life happens and within that grace period of 150 days, anything can happen as we know. When the casino comes to collect the extension of credit and the account has insufficient funds, the bill states verbatim, a licensee may pursue all civil remedies at law to recover any amount of credit that is not repaid or otherwise resolved. All interest assessed consistent with this section and the reasonable cost associated with an action to recover amounts due. So the casinos, after 150 days, will come collecting money. Yes, we've heard that they're, oh, these are our good customers, and we really don't want to, um, you know, treat them bad. We're just doing it for convenience. But let's face it, the casino is not there to give away $1,000. We know that they're going to want their money. And when you can't pay because you have all your other bills, this is a low to middle income person. They don't have a whole lot of money, but now they're stuck in debt. And what we're saying is that we want to raise that floor so that it's not just any 
Joe or Sally that can go up there and get a thousand dollars, but maybe you know five thousand, three thousand, anything's better than a thousand because a lot of people would get caught up. While we've heard that casinos do not post interest on these markers, a considerable portion of this bill is dedicated to enshrining their right to tack on interest and other penalties in the law. The amendment adds an additional guardrail since these liberties will be enshrined into law. As we stated, as was stated by my colleague in committee on Monday, the casinos came back to us just last year to expand sports betting. So we know from experience that they will ask their legislature to expand this policy to pursue gambling debts. Casinos are not banks, you know, they shouldn't be loaning money. And then the idea that, oh yes, you know, casinos do add a lot of revenue. They do add a lot of revenue and they're making really good money and they really contribute to Colorado's economy. But what we don't want is for people to get more into debt because of gambling. It's one thing to spend your own money when you go, the cash that you carry, go to your ATM and after a couple of tries, maybe your ATM won't give you any more money or maybe you, you're overdrawn. But it's another thing to get in debt. It's a whole different level. So we're asking for your yes vote so we can make sure that we're protecting Colorado families and not turning people who are already predisposed to gambling into and getting them deeper into debt. I ask for your yes vote on this amendment. Uh, Representative Mabry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members, I come up to also ask for a yes vote on this amendment. Um, you know, this bill um, is being um, marketed as uh, being for people who are high rollers who don't carry this amount of money uh, in cash around. I heard one of the talking points for in support of this bill was that ATMs have limits of up to 2,500 bucks. I think that this amendment is a good compromise then because the, it sets the floor at $3,000, right? If, if our argument for this is that, well, you can't take out that much money from an ATM, okay, then let's set this as the floor. I don't think casinos should be in the lending business. I think if you have to take out a loan when you're gambling, especially if that loan is for as low as $1,000, that is not good. We should not encourage that sort of behavior. If you don't have easy access to $1,000, if you can't get $1,000 from an ATM, you should not be taking a loan from a casino. So you should vote yes on this amendment because people, if they're gambling, if they can really afford to gamble, they have $1,000 that they can get out of the ATM. You should vote yes on this amendment to prevent casinos from being lenders. Um, thank you, Representative ba oh, Snyder. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the representative for Denver for his passion and comments. But I mean, this is not the case that is going on in this space, okay? There are so many protections as we've already, and I think everybody's agreed, all the protections are, are very good and vigorous. I wanna mention one other thing, that the casinos will be required to keep three years of records pertaining to the extension of credit including documentation of the credit extended, su substantive assessment of a person's credit history under subsection one, and the record of repayment or payment or failure to make payment of the credit. They have to make the records available within five days to the division of business. So let's, you know, let's give this a chance and see if there is any of these projections of you know, bad consequences for people. And finally, the truth is if they can clear all the hurdles, they're not a problem gambler. Like I said, if they were, this would have been flagged by those wonderful organizations that look out for people that do fall victim to gambling addiction. Uh, allow them to have, allow these, allow the division to, to check out what happens in this space. The reason that they have chosen $1,000 for this, Colorado is not, nor should ever want to be, Las Vegas or Reno or Nevada. Okay, we have built this. We have these towns that were struggling, old mining towns. We had a statewide ballot measure. I know because my town of Manitou Springs at one time was in play for that. We didn't want gambling. We were able to keep it ourselves out of the ballot. But these towns were on, were on the dying end, and this has given them a breath of life. They have labored under restrictions like limited stakes. At one time, the maximum bet was $5. We've relieved them of a lot of those. They're trying to build an industry, a healthy, good industry, 
They have set the number that they want at $1,000 for a reason. I have no reason to think they're wrong. I appreciate my com the comments from my colleague from Aurora. But again, if people qualify, in the end, isn't it their money? Isn't it their decision to make that personal decision? What I'm hearing is, you know, you just, you know, you just don't understand. You don't understand how much trouble this could cause for you. We're going to set the limits instead. We're going to make sure that you don't ha that you don't get in trouble. My goodness, I I believe in personal liberty. I think people have a right to do what they want with their money, and if they qualify for this program, let them make that decision, not us here in this chamber. Thank you. And I ask for a no vote on this amendment. Representative Bottoms. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to reiterate again. Um, Actually, I think the scenario, that the uh, storyline scenario that Representative Ricks laid out is what I would have said. Um, that, was, that was a good explanation of this. Um, I'm in favor of this amendment. And, and here's something else again, is if, if we're actually saying that we want to help people not have to carry these large stacks of cash, is $1,000 that large stack of cash that we're really talking about here? I mean, really, that that's the, the stack of cash that is going to be a, a problem here? I can understand 10000 You don't want to be carrying that around in cash, maybe 5000 But um, But uh, $1,000, that doesn't make sense. And so if somebody is taking out a line of credit for $1,000 that they could literally put in their wallet, why... Why would we say, hey, this is a good idea? I do believe strongly in personal freedoms. I've been trying to argue that with almost everything, and, uh, and it gets knocked down, knocked down, knocked down, until we say, hey, let's let these people that have um, serious addictions gamble themselves into a further hole. Now let's let them have personal liberties. That, that's a little, that's a little uh, frustrating to me. And so I strongly urge an I vote on this amendment because we didn't get the other one. Representative, I think Representative Luck wanted to speak on this amendment. Okay, Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd just like to make the point that it is not always just your own money. The money belongs to families. It belongs to the people at home. If you, most of these transactions are, are not done with cash. They are done with credit cards. So you show up there and you have, you're going to have a limit on your credit card, what you can withdraw, what you can withdraw on your ATM, and, and, then, you're, and then you're somewhat constrained at how much damage that you can do. So this, this helps, helps somebody extend the amount of damage they can do to their, to their family finance. I was just looking at, because we did talk about this uh, a couple of times, and because I would suspect, just like every other piece of legislation, it ends up being going to an expansion. And if we look at the original, this is licensee may pursue all, rem all remedies at law to recover any amount of credit that is not repaid or otherwise resolved. And then the Senate added, a licensee may pursue all civil remedies at law to recover any amount of credit that is not repaid. So. I would say just by noting that where this bill started, this bill started with all remedies at law. Now, I don't know for sure if that would include criminal or how it would include criminal, but it was the Senate in their amendment who specifically made it, limited it to, uh, to civil penalties. So I would anticipate that in growing this, my concern, I shouldn't say anticipate, my, my concern is that in the future when there's a rash of unpaid, when there's a rash of unpaid uh, debits against these, these, uh, these chips, that all of a sudden we come back and we say, hey, we need to, we need to make these penalties criminal so that we can so that we can uh, go after these because now, now the casinos are hurting because, and we know that they're not because this is just loaning air. Um, this is a, a surefire win, this is a surefire bet for the casinos. 
So, because they will win, but we will come back and then they'll, if, they, if we assign criminal p penalties and then we look at what's going on in Las Vegas right now with criminal penalties, that incurs huge costs to the state. So I think this is a good compromise. I like $10,000 be better, obviously, but I think, uh, I, th I think the uh, compromise that my uh, colleague has come up with is a, uh, is a good one. It does provide a little bit more barrier uh, to, uh, and, and so, that's, so that's good. And it just keeps a few more people out that shouldn't be uh, gambling on borrowed money. Representative Weinberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks again to my colleague from El Paso. Again, the intent of this bill was not designed of criminalizing people and throwing them into jail. The intent of this bill was to help the industry, the casino industry, and bring revenue into the state of Colorado. I truly think the bill as written has been stakeholded well, and any compromise with the $1,000 I think is an issue. And I would urge a no vote on this amendment. Um, Representative Snyder. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I agree with my colleague, folks. We have been discussing this with uh, the casinos and looking if there was any way we could change this. This is a new program. This is what they feel will give them the best chance of building a good base of customers, loyal customers. And so we just continue respectfully to ask for a no vote on this amendment. I'm Representative Luck. On the amendment? Okay, Representative Luck. Okay, but we're going to finish. A division has been called. However, we're going to finish the debate on this amendment before going to the division. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to ask a question, a clarifying question, because I've heard about the need for this being that we have individuals from other states who want to come here and don't want to carry cash with them. I don't understand that. We don't live in 1982 anymore. So... Why do we need this at all? Because if they have the money or they have the ability to have the money, don't they have little cards that fit in little things, you know, cases of varying sizes? Like, I, I really don't understand if that's the population of folks we're, we're trying to focus in on, why the current credit system, the current digital currency type system is not sufficient to cover what is being contemplated here. Um, thank you. Is there further discussion on L015? Okay. Um, Okay, um, the question is the adoption of L015 to SB 23259. A division has been requested. All those in the chamber not entitled to vote, please be seated. All those in favor of L015, please stand and remain standing or raise your hand and keep it raised until the count is taken.
Folks, make sure you stay standing in one location or raise your hand. We are still counting the votes up here. Did you have her? Okay. Um, thank you very much. You may be seated. All those opposed, please stand or raise your hand and remain standing in one place until the count is taken. Um, thank you. You may be seated. Um, L015 passes. Um, is there any further discussion on SB 23259? Uh, Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, uh, I guess that was exciting. Folks, please simmer down so we can hear um, people at the well. Thank you. Representative DeGraff, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. All right, so in the, uh, in the bill, it's talked about as it, it is interest-free. It's 150 days. After that, it gets, a little bit, uh, it gets a little bit confusing as to what happens there. It does limit it, and it includes the uh, Uniform Code of UCC, Uniform Consumer Credit Code. And that has a range of approximately, currently has a range, as I understand it, from about 8 to 12 percent. Of course, the, the higher the percentage, the more incentive there is to loan the money. So um, what this, uh, so I, I move L021 and ask that it be properly displayed. I see it's properly displayed. All right, Thank so what this- Thank you, L021 has been moved and is properly displayed. Please proceed to tell us about your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. This just modifies the, uh, basically it's, it's as the Uniform Consumer Co Credit Code allows, and this just puts a cap on it, so that if the Uniform Consumer Credit Code uh, goes higher, or this just kind of meets it in the middle right now, it's about eight to 12%. This just says, hey, we're, not, we're just going to cap the interest rate at 12%, so if the UCC goes higher in the future, there's less incentive to, because uh, the higher the percentage, the more 
the more risk the, uh, of course, we've already established that there's no risk. There's no risk for the uh, casino in accepting a marker. So what this would do is it just, it, it just makes it a little bit uh, less of an incentive for the, uh, for the, for the lending. So if the, uh, if the UCC goes higher, then this is protected. We're, we have a cap on it. If it stays the same, we still have a cap because it can be lower because it's 8 to 12 percent, I think, right now. So this would just cap it at, at 10 percent. I ask Thank for an I vote on this amendment. Is there further discussion on L021? Representative Snyder. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not sure why my colleague from El Paso County wants to raise the cap on the interest rate. Uh, right now, Colorado has an across the board when an when a action is silent on an interest rate, it's capped at 8 percent. And so that wouldn't change unless we adopt this amendment, and I would strongly urge a no vote. Representative DeGraff. Well, I do appreciate that, and maybe I should withdraw it, because as I understood it, it was somewhere between 8 and, 10 per, 8 and 12 percent on, uh, on the range that's currently allowed by the UCCC and that this would limit it to 10%, so that it's not capped right now at 8%, but it has the range of 8 to 12%. So are you, so I just want confirmation before we go with this, uh, be, before I withdraw this, that the current rate would be currently capped at 8%. Um, thank you, Representative Snyder. Okay, um, Representative Snyder. Yes. Representative DeGraff. With the confirmation, based on the confirmation of my colleague, who I trust despite, I will, uh, I will withdraw this amendment. Thank you. The amendment is withdrawn. Um, is there any further discussion on SB 23259? I'm seeing none. The question before us is the adoption of, oh, I'm sorry, Representative Luck. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just really quickly on this withdrawn amendment. My understanding, though, is that you can, the parties can contract outside of that particular limit. So could the casinos put in their terms that they are charging a higher interest rate if we don't cap it? Representative Snyder. That's not my understanding, Rep Luck, but I'd be happy to drill down and get you a clearer answer. Okay, thank you. Is there any further discussion on SB 23259? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of SB 23259. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no? No. The ayes have it. Um, SB 23259 is adopted oh. as amended. Okay, Mr. Schiebel, can you please read us the title of SB 23034? Senate Bill 34 by Senators Fields and Pelton B, also Representatives Evans and McLaughlin, concerning the definition of serious bodily injury in Section 18-1-901, Colorado Revised Statutes. Um, thank you, Representative Evans. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move the Judiciary Committee Report and Senate Bill 034. Thank you. Um, to the Judiciary Report, who would, um, Representative Evans. Thank you, Madam Chair. So in judiciary, uh, we had some very good discussion about this bill, uh, but as is often the case, that discussion continued after Judiciary Committee had ended, and we were actually able to come to a consensus afterwards that brought all of the major stakeholders to either neutral or better. Um, and so because of that, what we're going to ask you to do today is to reject or vote no on the Judiciary uh, Committee report. Uh, thank you, Representative McLaughlin. This is for the people on the other side of the aisle that do not listen to Republicans. <laughs> we are asking you to vote no <laughs> on the Judiciary Report, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Representative McLaughlin. I would not want to think that you were impugning um, Democrats. I am not, but there are a few. Listening to maybe. Republicans, I don't know. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure there's no impugning going on here. Oh, no um, impugning. So, at all. Um, seeing. Uh, any further discussion on the Judiciary Report? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of the Judiciary Report for SB 23034. All in favor, please say aye. All opposed, please say no. No! Yay! 
the no's, you pretty much almost unanimously have it. Um, as the judiciary report fails. To the bill, who would like to discuss the bill? Representative Evans. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, having rejected the Judiciary Committee report, what this bill does is this takes us back to the Senate version uh, of the bill. The bill is discussing the definition for serious bodily injury, or SBI. And all this does is it recognizes the trauma and the danger that can occur if someone suffers a penetrating knife or gunshot wound. And so it just adds that language into the definition of serious bodily injury. Um, this is a definition that is used a lot uh, out in the um, uh, criminal justice world and things like that. And so this is just recognizing that if somebody suffers a gunshot wound, penetrating gunshot wound or knife wound, that needs to be considered something that is serious bodily injury. The second half of this consensus that we were able to reach uh, involves uh, just defining that a little bit more. So with that, I move Amendment L007 uh, to the bill and ask for it to be displayed. Thank you, L007 has been moved and is properly displayed. Representative McLaughlin. Yes, this bill, I mean, sorry, this amendment gets the uh, Colorado Criminal Defense Bar at neutral with our bill. They, um, they agreed with it, so thank you. Um, thank you. Is there further discussion on L007? Representative Weissman. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I just wanted to add my two cents. We have had some unusual procedure here in the rejection of the committee report that was necessary, so we didn't have a subtle question issue as to this amendment. Uh, I am strongly in support of this amendment. It makes a, a small but useful clarification to the re-engrossed version that came over to us in committee. Uh, I'll reserve other comments about the bill, but I very much appreciate the ongoing work of the sponsors and criminal justice stakeholders to frankly clean up the mess that we made in committee and get us back to this place. So I'm urging a strong yes vote on L7. Thank you. Is there further discussion on L007 to SB 23034? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of SB 23, L, or the L007 to SB 23034. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Okay, that's pretty much unanimously adopted. L007 passes. Um, to the bill. Representative McLaughlin. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. The, um, the General Assembly, um, we had a um, law, an issue called the serious bodily injury, and there were two um, homeless people fighting, and one of them stabbed the other one. And because, um, and the guy had to go to the hospital, but it did not kill the second person. And, um, and it, the hospitals thought that it was a, called a serious bodily injury, and they put him up. But the court said it was not serious because he did not die and it did not hit an organ. The knife did not hit an organ. So this is just to say that um, we're kind of looking at the intent. And if the intent was to stab or shoot a gun into someone um, and it penetrates um, the body, that that should be a serious bodily injury. Thank you. Um, Representative Evans. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just to add on to this, this bill, uh, this new definition recognizes the fact that when somebody sustains an injury, a penetrating injury as a result of a knife or a gun, there is more injury that is involved there other than merely the physical aspect. There is an entire mental and emotional component to this. And so with this definition, what we are doing is ensuring that victims receive the appropriate recognition for the fact that they sustained serious bodily injury as a result of a penetrating knife or gunshot wound, and so we ask for your I vote. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on SB 23034? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of SB 23033. We, we already passed the amendment, correct? Yeah. 034. Um, all in favor of the bill, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Uh, SB 23034 passes. Thanks, Evan. Mr. Schiebel, can you please read the title of SB 23097? Senate Bill 97 by Senators Zenzinger and Gardner, also Representatives Byrd and Soper, concerning the adoption of the 2023 recommendations of the Colorado Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice regarding motor vehicle offenses committed by a person who is not the owner of the motor vehicle and in connection therewith making an appropriation. 
Thank you, Representative Byrd. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Senate Bill 97 and the Judiciary Report and the Appropriations Committee Report. Okay, to the Appropriations Committee Report. Representative Mem Byrd. Members in the Appropriations Committee, we appropriated money to fund the bill. We ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the Appropriations Committee Report to SB 23097? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Uh, the uh, Appropriations Report passes. To the Judiciary Report, Representative Byrd. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the Judiciary Committee, we added an amendment making clear that a person who is subject to prosecution or charging under um, the law as we're amending it will not also be um, subject to prosecution under 184401. So we ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the Judiciary Report? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the Judiciary Report to SB 23097. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it. The Judiciary Report, SB 23097, is adopted. To the bill. Representative Byrd. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, um, this bill, we have seen in the news, we've heard from our constituents, they are telling us that their cars are being stolen and data backs this up. Um, we are working to revise our laws so that the value of a car is no longer a determinant for the severity of, of the crime that is um, recognized. We know that the value of a car isn't just measured by its dollar value. It's really um, certainly very important um, no matter what the value is. And we need to correct our laws and we ask for a yes vote. Thank you, Representative Sopar. Merci, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Representative Byrd. Members, this is the uh, auto uh, theft bill that you've been looking forward to all session long. One thing that we've heard from our constituents over the last several years is you guys need to do something about auto theft, and you need to be tough on crime in this particular area, and that's the bill you have before you right now. And we're treating uh, poor and wealthy uh, victims uh, the same to where uh, now law enforcement does not look to the value of the car. Instead, they're looking at going after the criminal. And that's what's important here, making sure that um, we're not rewarding um, wealthy victims and punishing poor victims. And being able to felonize auto theft is important. It actually uh, aligns with our uh, burglary laws so that um, we don't look to, um, is your house worth more than someone else's home when it turns to burglary? And we'd ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on SB 23097? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of SB 23097. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. SB 23097 is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, can you please read the title of SB 23269? Senate Bill 269 by Senators Buckner and Rich, also Representatives Lukens and Bradfield, concerning creating a bonus payment program to incentivize Colorado preschool providers to participate in Colorado Universal Preschool Program and a connection with making an appropriation. Thank you. Representative Lukens. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Senate Bill 23 269. Thank you. To the bill. Uh, so this bill, Colorado Preschool Provider, uh, Preschool Program Provider, Bonus payments is a bill that will establish one-time bonuses for providers who participate in the universal preschool program this, that will launch this fall. Um, the bill aims to make sure we have enough universal preschool providers to serve all children. Um, and we have set um, aside a, a, an appropriation for this bill. Um, it su supports the first year of universal preschool and ensures that all children have access to universal preschool classrooms in their community. I ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on SB 23269? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of SB 23269. All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. SB 23269 is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, can you please read the title of HB 23194? House Bill 1194 by Representatives McLaughlin and Puglisi, also Senators Simpson and Janal, concerning efforts to remediate risks associated with certain closed landfills and in connection therewith, creating the Closed Landfill Remediation Grant Program, requiring the Department of Public Health and Environment to work collaboratively with local governments to address concerns before implementing certain enforcement mechanisms and establishing a process for resolving disputes between local governments and the Department of Public Health and Environment. Thank you. Um, rep that was excellent, Mr. Schiebel. Uh, Representative McLaughlin. 
Yes, um, I'm in House Bill um, 1194 with the, um, let's see. Transportation education? and appropriations, perhaps? And Yes, appropriations, transportation, please. Okay, well, let's go first to the tra um, appropriations report. Who would like to tell us about that? Representative Puglisi. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we went through appropriations and got the funding that we needed. Um, um, there's about $15 million that's allocated, um, and we'll go into, as we tell you about this bill, why that's so important for all of Colorado. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the appropriations report to SB or HB 23-1194? Seeing none, the question is the adoption of the appropriations report. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Okay, the appropriations report is adopted. Um, to the transportation, housing, and local government report, Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. We made a lot of technical um, corrections on this. It was kind of a, it was a new bill. We were just getting started, so we made them all there, and we haven't had any since. So we're very happy that we went through inch by inch and, um, and, and did the big stuff in committee. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the transportation, housing, and local government report to uh, HB 23-1194? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the transportation, housing, and local government report. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The transportation, housing, and local government report is adopted. To the bill, Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. So if anyone in here represents a county, this bill is for you. Some of you represent counties. This, um, this bill was approved 100% by Colorado counties. Um, and as far as we know, it's the first time they've ever approved this by 100%. So if you vote for this, your constituents will love you. This bill was brought to me by uh, La Plata County um, commissioners. They had a landfill in the 1990s that needed to close, and they closed according to um, everything that was going on with CDPHE at the time. They closed it down, they remediated it, they, they watched it. Then the federal law changed, and suddenly they were out of compliance. So they had to start cleaning this landfill that they had closed all over again. Um, CDPHE was charging them fines for having um, a landfill that was out of compliance, and they were trying to save county money to fix the darn landfill. So this bill is kind of a, it's a great combination between the counties and CDPHE, how it turned out, and it turns out that there are these uh, landfills all over Colorado that need remediation. Representative Puglisi. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I um, really appreciate the work that my co-prime has done on this. This is a really important issue. When I was a county commissioner, um, we dealt with this closed landfill issue for the whole time um, I was a commissioner. Um, so it's been over a decade. And um, the partnership with Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment is incredibly important. I'm glad that the Appropriations Committee um, gave us a favorable recommendation and allocated the money that is needed for these counties to remediate these landfills. It's an environmental issue, um, and it's also an issue that touches all of us. And so we would urge an aye vote. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on SB 23-1194? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of HB 23-1194. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. HB 23-1194 is adopted. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schiebel, can you please read the title of SB 23203? Senate Bill 203 by Senator Fields, also Representative Soper and Marshall, concerning the authority of the Office of the Inspector General and the Department of Corrections to apprehend fugitives. Uh, Representative Marshall. Yes. Uh, I'd like to move Senate Bill 23 TAC 203, please. Excellent. Um, it's been moved. Please to the bill. Representative uh, members, this is a very easy. Marshall. Representative Marshall. I still can't hear, but okay. So, uh, members, this is a very easy bill from the uh, agency itself. Normally, I would prefer to see our Inspector General Office have a Chinese wall between them and the field. Unfortunately, sometimes the world is not perfect, and they are having severe labor issues and need to apprehend many fugitives and don't have the manpower to do it. But 
it just so happens they have a huge manpower pool of these inspector generals that are totally qualified, post-certified, can do the apprehensions, but they are by law not allowed to do them right now because of the law we have set up. So this bill just simply allows them to have the option, not the requirement, to dip into their inspector general core, so to speak, and utilize that manpower in order to apprehend fugitives. So I would think we should give them that discretion. It's not the ideal situation, but it is the situation we are faced with and the solution to the problem they have. Representative Sapar. Merci, Madam Chair. And uh, I just want to thank my co-prime sponsor. Excellent job of describing what the bill does. Uh, this does make sense. When you have a fugitive, you should utilize all hands on deck that the Department of Correction has, and that's what this bill allows for, and nothing more. And we'd ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Um, Representative Luck. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Amendment L001 and ask that it be displayed. Thank you. L001 has been moved and is uh, properly displayed. Please proceed to tell us about your amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. This amendment just adds a reporting requirement so that we know how many of the IGs are being used for this work and the impact that that has on their normal tasks, on their current tasks, what they're up to, um, what, what the statute says that they need to be doing. My concern is that we, we are adding a greater burden on the IG's office because we can't either fund fully the FAU, the, the Fugitive Apprehension Unit, or because they can't attract people into that particular unit. And so just to get a clear picture of what is going on and how many um, folks that they are working to apprehend and how that impacts on their other duties, I think is an important thing for this legislature to continue as we move forward in this particular space. And with having so many prisons, um, I, I do think that it's necessary intel for us as we create future policies. And so I ask for an I vote. Representative Sopar. Merci, Madam Chair. I appreciate um, where the amendment's coming from, Representative Luck. Um, I appreciate you showing it to us in advance so, so that we could at least have an opportunity to kind of vet it out. We, um, we, we are going to ask for a no vote, unfortunately. And it's mainly because it's, the department does not anticipate utilizing the Inspector General's office often because you know, put, put, putting it out there to everyone watching at home, we don't have fugitives that often. But when we do have fugitives, and it's that time when they need to utilize all hands on deck and be able to have everyone who's post-certified be able to participate in um, apprehending the uh, inmate who's absconded. Uh, to, to be able to do so without going back around, without this huge administrative burden of then making a report further on um, who, who all was there. I mean, that just adds to already an agency that's quite strapped. And uh, that's why we're asking for a no vote here. Thank you. Representative Marshall. Yeah, I would also ask for a no vote. I'm very sympathetic, actually, to the amendment. Um, seeing at this point, though, I'm concerned it does put an additional administrative burden on top of it. Um, I do believe, though, that the use of these IG is not just on one massive manhunt but it is meant to be more of an ongoing basis because of parole jumpers. There are fugitives all the time out there, and they're having an increased workload of getting fugitives, and they have this manpower that's available that just because of our law isn't allowed to be utilized. Um, and I would be sympathetic for, for the reporting back. It's just at this moment, having this drop now without our Senate sponsor being on board and the extra administrative burden, um, I think we really need to ask for a no. Uh, thank you. Um, is there any further discussion on L001? Um, seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L001 to SB 23203. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. <laughs> SB, or L001 to SB 23203 fails. To the bill. Um, is there any further discussion? Please vote yes. Um, okay. 
Is there any further discussion on SB 23-203? All in, I'm seeing none. The question before us is the adoption of SB 23-203. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. SB 203 is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, can you please read the title of SB 23-257? Senate Bill 257 by Senators Burgess and Gardner, also representatives to Tone and Bakkenfeld, concerning funding for auto theft prevention programs and a connection therewith making an appropriation. Uh, Representative to Tone. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Senate Bill 257 and the appropriations report. Um, or not. I see no appropriations report. All right, then report. we won't move that. We'll just do the bill. Which is crazy because the title of the bill has an appropriation I in it. Know. However, well, Representative to Tone. Thank you. Yeah, the appropriation went on in the Senate. So <laughs> there it. we go. Uh, so, members, the uh, auto theft was a topic of a previous bill, uh, and we're back with another way to combat this, and this is with uh, the auto, th auto Theft Prevention Cash Fund. So, this organization called the Auto Colorado Auto Theft Prevention Authority, which we, we call CATPA, uh, is an organization that gets money from insurance policies to combat auto theft, but they are not able to get any money from the state. So the state government here uh, wants to give them some extra cash to try to uh, wrangle in these uh, auto theft people. And uh, this is what this bill does. It puts in the statute that we can authorize this money from the general fund into their program. And uh, they're gonna do statewide education and outreach. They're going to do uh, theft enforcement for overtime. Uh, there's gonna be automated license plate readers and uh, a victim support fund, which is really important in this case uh, to make sure that when victims have issues, they don't have insurance, that they can actually respond with this fund to help them out and uh, get them back on their feet if they are a victim of the theft. So ask for a yes vote on this bill, uh, and let's help uh, our citizens uh, with this problem that we've been experiencing for a while. Representative Bachenfeld, and I have to say that's an excellent imitation of Representative Sane. I don't know. What? This is an excellent bill. Vote yes. Okay, um, I appreciate the brevity. Um, seeing no, for, is there any further discussion on SB 23257? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of SB 23257. All in favor, please say aye. All opposed, no. SB 23257 is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, can you please read the title of HB 23220? House Bill 1220 by Representatives Holtorf and McCormick. Concerning a study regarding the economic impact of the elimination of large capacity groundwater withdrawal within the Repu <coughs> Republican River Basin and a connection therewith, requiring the Colorado Water Center to conduct the study and report its findings and conclusions to certain legislative committees. Thank you, Representative McCormick. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 23-1220 and the appropriations report. Uh, thank you to the appropriations report. Representative McCormick. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. In appropriations, we were able to um, acquire the funding needed to do this study, and I urge an I vote. Thank you, Representative um, Holtorf. I also urge an I vote. Okay, is there any further discussion on the appropriations report? Um, seeing none, the question be, uh, for us is the adoption of the appropriations report to HB 23-1220. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Okay, the appropriations report to HB 23-1220 is adopted. Representative McCormick to the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna speak very quickly and um, short because I see a lot of people want to speak to this bill, so I wanna give them all the time that they need. So if passed, House Bill 1220 will provide an economic analysis and impact statement for future years in Colorado, Western Nebraska and Kansas because it is important that we it's important that we determine the economic impact if Colorado does not ret retire the needed acres and economic fallout in Colorado, Kansas and Nebraska. It includes the economic impact on our rural housing market, our public services, 
our banking, our hospital districts, our fire districts, our school districts, and all these communi communities that are affected by the Republican River Basin across three states, um, super important to the northeast part of our state, I urge and I vote on House Bill 1220. Thank you, Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just to highlight the importance of this bill, the chairwoman of the Ag Committee is standing strong for rural Colorado. And I don't want that to be overlooked by my list of colleagues that are all here now that have gained an incredible interest in the Republican River, one of eight basins. The, the truth is there's over 500,000 irrigated acres in this basin. And based on an agreement in 2016 with three states, Colorado, Kansas, and Nebraska, we have a requirement to retire 25,000 irrigated acres in the South Fork focus zone. If we don't do that, then the issue is going to come up. There could be litigation from the other states that could cause the entire basin, 500,000 acres to be at risk of being shut down. And for those of us that are farmers, if you irrigate, you can plant three times the seed population you can if you're a drylander. If you irrigate, you can guarantee 12 to 20 plus inches of water on your crop. When you're a drylander, you pray for rain and get what God gives you which may or may not make a crop. So the importance of water to agriculture and farming is so important. And for those of you that are gardeners, and I have a few over here that aren't paying attention, that water matters. And Eastern Colorado needs that water. This is gonna help Colorado, Eastern Colorado and the Republic River Basin understand the way ahead and help those farmers continue to farm. So I urge an I vote. Is there any further discussion on HB 23-1222 seeing, oh, oh, Representative Bockenfeld, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. This, as Representative Holtorf and Representative McCormick just explained, this is a very, very important bill for our agriculture community here in the state of Colorado, specifically Eastern Colorado. Please vote yes on this bill. It's very, very important. We need this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Winter. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also rise in support in this bill, and I appreciate my colleague from Akron and all the hard work he's done on this. I honestly know how important this is for his district. And one thing about Representative Holtorf is when he comes here to the state capitol, he fights hard for his district and the people in his district. Um, that's why they respect him. So I, I seriously urge and I vote uh, for, for this passion of his and for eastern rural Colorado. Thank you. Representative Sopar. Representative Sopar. Madam Chair, thank you. I uh, just rise. I have several questions for uh, at least one of the bill sponsors. <laughs> Number one, um, being a Republican and in the basin, I do kind of wonder if this is a 21C type bill, but I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> and as a Western Sloper, I'm slightly concerned about the um, possibility of this being a water grab for more Western Slope water to the Eastern Plains, I mean, I'm just saying, there, there is that fear that comes out, and uh, not to pick a water fight, but, you know, we, we, we are concerned. Representative um, Taggart. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Given the fact that we in Grand Junction have senior water rights on the Republican River, we would like Trans Mountain Diversion up across the divide and back into the Colorado where it's deserving. Thank you. Representative Weinberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, Loveland, all for Loveland. Loveland is the best city in the state of Colorado. We like our water. This looks like a rural grab on our water rights and Loveland first, Loveland always. If the representative Holtorf could stay in his district and not come to these chambers, we would be Loveland and Loveland for everyone. Loveland. Which Republican would like to talk about the Republican River next? Um, representative Hartstuck. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Uh, as a Republican, I, I've got to stand up here in regards to the Republican River, and I'm, I'm not quite sure what we're trying to do here. I, I'm a little confused. I, I, I need some clarification. So, so Madam Chair, I would, I would ask the sponsors to get up here and explain a little bit more detail the purpose of this Republican River and what it's trying to do across the state. I'm not, we're, we're, are we giving our water away? Is that, uh, is, <laughs> is that what we're doing? But, uh, if, if they could answer that question, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Representative Hartsook, you know not what you ask. Representative Bradley. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, just looking over this bill, what is the bill again? Study Republican River Groundwater Economic Impact. Well, you know, some things I like about this bill, but <laughs> there are some things I just don't really like about this bill. So I guess, you know, with my five daughters, I'll just have to vote for this bill anyway. Thank you. Representative Bottoms. No, okay. Is there any further discussion on HB 23-1220? Representative Froelich. Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you. I would just like to know um, where the iceberg comes from for the desalinization. Thank you. Representative Holtorf, would you care to comment on any of these remarks? Okay. <laughs> Um, is there any further discussion on HB 23-1220? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of HB 23-1220. All, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. No! Well, um, HB 23-1220 passes anyway. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move the committee rise and report. Seeing no further, uh, seeing no objection, the committee will rise and report.
The House will come back to order. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 255. Oh, I'm reading the wrong piece of paper. Mr. Schiebel, please read the report of the Committee of the Whole. Yeah. Madam Speaker, your Committee of the Whole begs leave to report it is under consideration the following attached bills being the second reading thereof and making the following recommendations thereon. House Bill 1194 is amended, 1220 is amended, passed on second reading, ordered gross and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Senate Bill 14, 34 is amended, 54 is amended, 76 is amended, 97 is amended, 199 is amended, 203, 257, 259 is amended, 269, 285 is amended, passed on second reading, reading ordered revised and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Representative Kipp. Members, you've heard the motion. There is an amendment at the desk. Mr. Schiebel, please read the Weinberg Amendment to the Committee of the Whole report. Representative Weinberg moves to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the committee in adopting the following Rick's Amendment L15 to Senate Bill 259 to show that said amendment lost and that Senate Bill 259 passed. Representative Weinberg. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, fellow colleagues, you heard the debate on this one. The original intent of the bill as written works, literally has the endorsement, and I don't think messing with the original intent is a thing we need to mess with. I urge and I vote on this amendment. Representative Ricks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, thank you for standing for Coloradoans earlier when you voted to support the $3,000 floor that is actually protecting Coloradoans from and those people who are predisposed to being gamblers. They're going to take advantage of this $1,000 credit and all of a sudden they're into more debt. So I ask that you stand. Remember, this is about a floor. When this bill started out, it had a zero a floor, so that meant anybody could borrow $50, $100, $500. Now they moved it up to $1,000, but that still is going to affect a lot of people. We're asking for $3,000, and those who stood with us, thank you for standing with us before. Please vote so that we can keep this amendment in here and protect Coloradoans. Uh, Representative Snyder. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, I know there's folks that see predatory practices all over the place. I think we established this is not a predatory program. And really what it is, in Colorado, we have 32-some casino companies, the four big ones that are, you know, very successful and large. Really, this bill is designed to help those small casinos that are struggling, trying to build a customer base, trying to build a loyalty program, trying to be convenient as possible to their customers. Uh, so, as we mentioned, that $1,000 floor is, is for a reason. That's what's going to help those smaller, struggling casino companies. So I urge a yes vote on this Cal Amendment. Thank you. Representative Frizzell. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Colleagues, I rise in support of this amendment. I had the opportunity to hear this bill, and I've had a lot of conversations around it, because at first I thought, I don't, I don't know if this is a good thing. I'm not sure if this is a good thing for Colorado. But after really diving in deep and getting a better understanding of what this bill is about, who it's supposed to be helping. I, I, I very much support the efforts of the bill sponsors. I was shocked to find out that Colorado is the only one of three states in the United States that does not offer credit at the casinos. And that, I was fascinated, I had no idea. But the thing we have to remember is we have also, in this state, built a hierarchy of funding mechanisms based on our gambling industry. And it is a big benefit, actually, to these state programs and the citizens that they serve to make sure that our 
casino industry, which was approved by the voters, remains healthy, that it remains healthy and vibrant. I was also really surprised to find out that casinos share information. So when they do extend credit, they're able, th this information is, is put into a database and it's shared from casino to casino to really avoid some of the, some of the issues that have been discussed. I think it's really important that we understand and embrace that this is, this is a, this is not an unusual practice, that this has been going on for a long time. And in fact, in order to attract the, the, the high rollers, the tourism, this is a really good thing for our casino industry. It's a great thing for the state of Colorado, Colorado funding mechanisms that are based on the gambling industry. And I very strongly urge, and I vote on this amendment. Thank you. Representative DeGraff. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm still a little concerned on the, uh, the, 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 the kind of the double negative of the wording is a little bit confusing. So I'll be a, uh, a no vote on this amendment. So we stay with the, uh, so we stay with the, uh, the $3,000. Uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting idea with the chips. It does extend credit. It does uh, open up. And from what I've read is it opens up the, uh, it opens up the ability to, for uh, people to get into a little bit more trouble. So putting a little bit of a filter on it helps uh, preclude that, helps protect some uh, some people from that. That is a little bit of a hard decision because obviously for uh, you know for individual liberty. But this just puts a little guardrail on the program because uh, otherwise there is a uh, there's a perverse incentive for uh, for the casinos to extend money because it's a no lose. Uh, it's a no lose loan for the uh, the casino. They'll they loan the money and they'll either get it back or they collect it. So it so there is a so it's automatically missing, it's automatically missing the normal checks and balances of risk, and it puts it on the, uh, and it puts it all on the, on the individual. And so I think there just needs to be a little bit higher bounds of responsibility or of uh, capacity placed on that because uh, betting the house is not a, uh, a victimless crime. Representative Hamrick. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise in opposition to this amendment supporting the good representative from Aurora. Casinos should not be lenders. That said, this is a good compromise and a good floor number, so I urge your opposition to this amendment. Representative Mabry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, members, it is not often that me and my colleague from El Paso County come up here and ask you to vote the same way on an amendment, uh, but I really appreciate that both of us are standing up for the idea that casinos should not be in the business of lending people as low as $1,000. Again, one of the talking points for this bill was that ATMs have a limit of around 2,500 bucks and that this bill is for high rollers. Okay, well if this bill is for high rollers and the ATM limit is 2,500 bucks, let's, let's stick with this amendment. If you, if you don't have access to 2,500 bucks from an ATM card, you probably shouldn't be at the casino. We shouldn't be encouraging that. And um, I urge a no vote on this amendment. Representative Weinberg. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Safeguards, guardrails, that's what this bill actually does. We're not in the business of letting casinos lend out money, but ATM machines can do it willy-nilly. If somebody wants to gamble irresponsibly, it is going to happen. Why not let the industry set the standard and the bar? They are the protections around this. That's what this bill is. Guardrails, safeguards for irresponsible. 
Read the text of the bill. It was debated heavily in the Senate, and we got to this number off of stakeholdering with organizations and members of the body. It is very important to understand that what this is doing is putting the casinos in charge of lending out. We're not putting a bill together that bans banks or ATMs for giving you unlimited funds. This is giving our casino and gambling industry the power to be in control. This is a pro-business, pro-Colorado, pro-Tabor, pro-tax revenue bill. There is absolutely no reason to vote no. I urge and I vote on this amendment and let Colorado reap the benefits of additional Tabor refunds to your pocketbook and additional revenue to your cities. Please vote yes. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of the Weinberg Amendment to the Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Shee will please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Doherty, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Doherty votes yes. Representative Woodrow. Yes. With 33, please close the machine. With 33 aye, 30 no, and two excused, the Weinberg Amendment is adopted. <laughs> Members, there are no further amendments at the desk. The Committee of the Whole, the question before us is the adoption of the Committee of the Whole report. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Doherty, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Doherty votes yes. Please close the machine. With 46 ayes, 17 no, and to excuse the report of the Committee of the Whole is adopted. Madam Majority, oh, <laughs> Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move Senate Bill 255 on third reading final passage. Members, we are doing a couple of third readings at this time. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 255. Senate Bill 255 by Senators Roberts and Will, also Representatives McCluskey and Catlin concerning the provision of compensation to people who suffer damages because of gray wolf depredation and in connection therewith making and reducing appropriations. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker. Didn't I move it already? Okay. My Thank bad. You. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 255 on third reading final passage. The question before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 255 on third reading final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Doherty, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Doherty votes yes.
Representative Sharbini. Please close the machine. With 63 ayes, zero no, and two excuse, Senate Bill 255 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 256. Senate Bill 256 by Senators Will and Roberts, also Representatives Lukens and Soper, concerning prerequisites to the management of gray wolves prior to the wolves being reintroduced. Madam Majority Leader. Madam Speaker, I move Senate Bill 256 on third reading, final passage. Representative Story. Thank you, Madam. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, I cannot stress these points enough. Colorado has already invested $1 million in the NEPA process to acquire a 10-J rule. The NEPA process was initiated a year ago with anticipation of the finalization of the 10-J rule in mid-December this year. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has confirmed a multitude of times their intention to finalize the 10-J rule by mid-December 2023. Let the current NEPA process run its course. The legislature should not be inserting itself or manipulating a federal process that Colorado has specifically requested. Let's allow the NEPA process to acquire a 10-J rule proceed by allowing the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to do their good work. Let's leave wildlife management to the experts, our own Department of Natural Resources and Colorado Parks and Wildlife. The bill is a solution looking for a problem that does not exist. Colorado is on track to acquire a 10-J rule that by all accounts, all stakeholders are seeking. The legislature should not interfere with the NEPA process currently underway at a cost of $1 million to the taxpayers that would be lost if the current NEPA process is undone by Senate Bill 256. Members, I strongly urge a no vote on this bill, Senate Bill 23-256. Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, we're asking for a yes vote on Senate Bill 256. There's nothing in this bill that will disrupt the NEPA process because the NEPA process that was currently started was in anticipation of the 10-J rule being in place before wolves are reintroduced. Second of all, everyone has said they want to see the 10-J rule in place, whether it's um, the Ute Mountain Utes or the Southern Utes, to those of us on the Western Slope, to here on the Front Range. We've heard even from Colorado Parks and Wildlife, the vision of natural resources. Everyone has said they want to see the 10-J rule in place before wolves are reintroduced per Proposition 114. And according to the proposition itself, it, uh, its language says to take the essential steps needed by December 31st. And then also in the language, it talks about uh, working with landowners to guarantee a successful reintroduction and the tools to mitigate conflicts. 10J was developed by Congress within the Endangered Species Act of 1973 to do just that, to mitigate conflicts uh, with uh, landowners and to also get landowner buy-in when a species is being reintroduced, to be able to protect livestock and pet animals, and that's all that it does. And we're asking for a yes vote here today. Uh, this is um, something that, yes, we hope this will be an insurance policy. But if we aren't there by December 31st, this ensures that the latitude is there to not reintroduce wolves until we have 10J in place, and everyone expects it to be in place 
but this is our insurance plan, and we desperately need a yes vote here. Thank you. Representative Lukens. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I ask for a yes vote on Senate Bill 256. I don't come up, this is my first time ever coming up to speak on thirds. I have three things to say about this. One, Senate Bill 256 does not upend the NEPA process or the 10-J process. The 10-J process and the accompanying uh, environmental impact study is happening under federal law. Under the Supremacy Clause, federal law preempts state law. In its present form, Senate Bill 256 is a directive under state law to a state agency. No, nothing more. Two, this bill aligns with the scientific data and empowers CPW to manage gray wolves as mandated by Proposition 114. The voters narrowly supported Proposition 114. In order to uphold the will of the voters, we must enact all of Proposition 114, including the portion that empowers CPW to manage gray wolves. Three, I'm asking for your yes vote on this bill because establishing a 10J uh, is essential for maintaining a viable, self-sustaining gray wolf population while allowing state agencies and landowners landowners to devise management strategies without violating the Endangered Species Act and giving those impacted directly by wolves on the ground the tools they need, want, and deserve. I ask for a yes vote on Senate Bill 256. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 256 on third reading final passage. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Doherty, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Doherty votes yes. Please close the machine. With 41 aye, 22 no, and two excuse, Senate Bill 256 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Members, we are on third reading. Please. Close the machine. Bit of business, members. Mr. Schiebel, reports of committees of reference. Committee on Agriculture, Water, and Natural Resources, after consideration on the merits of committee recommends the following. Senate Bill 92 be amended as followed, and as so amended, be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. Signing of bills, resolutions, memorials. The speaker has signed Signing Senate of bill. bills, resolutions, memorials will be printed in the journal. Message from the Senate. Madam Speaker, the Message Senate Message from voted. the Senate will be printed in the journal. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the following bills be made special orders at 6.20 p.m. Senate Bill 277, Senate Bill 288, Senate Bill 281, Senate Bill 75, Senate Bill 293, Senate Bill 278, Senate Bill 289, Senate Bill 294, Senate Bill 173, House Bill 1066, and House Bill 1048. Seeing no objection, the bills listed by the Majority Leader will be made special orders at 6.20 p.m. <laughs> Representative Wilford. Members, you have heard the motion. Seeing no objection, the House will now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for consideration of special orders. Representative Wilford will take the chair.
The committee will come to order. With your unanimous consent, the bills will be read by title unless there's a request for reading a bill at length. Committee reports are printed and in your bill folders. Floor amendments will be shown on the screen and on your iPads. Bill will, bills will be laid over upon motion of the majority leader and the coat rule is extra relaxed. Mr. Schiebel, please, please read the title of Senate Bill Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of Senate Bill 277. Senate Bill 277 by Senators Buckner and Van Winkle, also Representative Valdez, concerning measures to provide resources to increase public safety and in connection therewith, extending related existing appropriations. Representative Valdez. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you. Uh, so we bring to you today Senate Bill, I move Senate Bill 277. To the bill. I bring before you today with my illustrious co-prime here, Representative Sopeo, a bill that uh, is a continuation of existing funding. Uh, these are programs that were funded uh, last year. It's been slow to get some of these programs started because um, staffing shortages, kind of the things we've all been hearing about. Um, but this bill will make sure that those programs continue uh, and that we do um, you know, do those programs and find out what their effects are. So uh, I would ask for an I vote on the bill, and thank you. Representative Sopair. Merci, Madam Chair, and thank you to my uh, co-prime sponsor, Representative Valdez. It's an honor to join you on this bill. Uh, this bill um, extends uh, three grant programs in the Department of Public Safety. Uh, with the original appropriated funds still in there, it just kicks out the, uh, the date uh, to allow them to continue their good work here for public safety, and we ask for a yes vote. Thank you. All right, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Senate Bill 277. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and Senate Bill 277 is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of Senate Bill 288. Senate Bill 288 by Senators Fields and Buckner, also Representatives English and Joseph, concerning measures to determine coverage for doula services and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Representative Joseph. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is truly an honor to serve with you. It is truly an honor to serve with you as well. Thank you. I move Senate Bill 23288. 288. To the bill, Representative Joseph. Thank you, Madam Chair. This bill requires the Department of Health Care Policy and Financing to take steps toward covering doula services and creates a doula scholarship program in the department. The bill also requires the Division of Insurance to perform a cost-benefit analysis of doula coverage, and it also requires the HICPOF to conduct stakeholder engagements and seek federal approval for doula services. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I ask for an I vote. Representative English. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we know that doulas are heroes in our community, and we need to support them in their work to provide access to mothers in need. That is why Governor was certain to include doula funding in his budget. Countless studies prove the effectiveness of doula services in soothing expectant mothers during pregnancy and improving overall health outcomes for mothers through postpartum. The United States has the highest rate of maternal mortality in developed nations. Most of these deaths are preventable. Prioritizing the health of our mothers and honoring cultural wisdom in birthing will create a healthier and safer Colorado. We ask for an I vote on this bill. Representative Holtor. So in my standard tradition as the ranking member in public health, we heard this bill. And I will tell you that um, because of the changes in our cultural dynamic, because of the uh, value that these individuals um, can provide to their community because of the importance of 
successful birthing outcomes for women, pregnant women that are having children in a very complicated process. And because of the cultural sensitivity requirements that the bill sponsors bring, I'm in support of this bill. Now, the one thing I must tell the chamber is there is an element of this that's going to require some uh, certification and licensure. And also, uh, Medicaid funding will have to be expanded. So this doesn't come without a cost, as most things in the medical and public health and human services space. But overall, this allows for more women to have successful birth outcomes for those babies that are coming to this world that want to have a chance to have their first birthday. So I'm completely in support of this bill. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption and passage of Senate Bill 288. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Senate Bill 288 is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of Senate Bill 281. Senate Bill 281 by Senator Zenzinger, also Representative McLaughlin, concerning a required notice of limited transferability of college credits for a non-regionally accredited higher education institution. Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move uh, Senate Bill 281. To the bill. Um, this is to save students money. Um, lots of students go to non-regionally um, accredited schools, and then they switch, they move, they want to go to another school, and um, the traditional schools, the regionally accredited, will not take them. They will not take their credits. So this is just to tell any student who is going to a non-accredited school that um, the credits may not go towards statewide prior learning policy. They caution the student about the limited transferability of their credits, and they advise the student to check if colleges they plan to transfer to accept credits from non-regionally accredited institutions. This will save the students a lot of money, and they won't go into debt um, with uh, credits that don't transfer. Thank you. Representative Taggart. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. And an honor to serve with you. I rise in very much support of this bill. As an individual who spends, when I'm not here, a great deal of time in the classroom at a university, I run into students that have gone through this. And not only are they upset because this was not disclosed at the time that they entered those institutions, so they are just decimated both financially and mentally about the fact that the hours that they put in just can't be accepted at an accredited school because it puts our accreditation in real trouble. And this really applies to young people that go into um, pre-institutions that want to go on to, into nursing schools. And it's a real problem. And uh, I, I, I really appreciate you bringing this forward because the look in, in those students' eyes when this happens, it just really, really scares you. It's not, it's not right. So it need, these schools need to be more transparent. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Senate Bill 281. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. Senate Bill 281 is adopted. It's too late. <laughs> we passed 280. So we're good. All right, Senate Bill 281 is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of Senate Bill 75. Senate Bill 75 by Senators Fields and Exum, also Representatives Ricks and Tatone, concerning the deletion of children's identifying information from crim criminal justice records released to the public in a connection therewith making an appropriation. Representative Ricks. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. I move SB 75 in the committee reports. To and the I bill. Ask, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. To the, so, to the bill. Um, 
This bill, members, um, is about the deletion of a child's name from criminal justice records. This bill essentially removes a child's name, a child's witness name from an affidavit and replace it with the words child victim or child witness in order to protect the identity of those involved in a criminal case. As it stands now, if a suspect of a crime is a minor child, their information is redacted from the public disclosure to protect their identity. But if the victim or witness of the crime is a minor, their information is not redacted in most cases. As a result, the suspects of a crime essentially have more privacy rights in the, than the victims of the crime. And so what this, this is is a public safety issue, and this bill is a basic rights issue. We ask for your, the, the rights of family privacy to be protected. We ask for your yes vote. Representative Titone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, minors and, uh, minor victims and witnesses and their families and peers can suffer long-lasting, serious impacts to mental and physical health when exposed to horrific personal crime details made available in the public domain without regard to a young person's ability to receive, process, and manage ongoing impacts of such information in a supported manner. This is really about uh, helping to protect these these uh, young people who are involved or in uh, a crime or witness to a crime, we don't want them to be retaliated against. We don't want them to feel intimidated. We don't want them to feel like they can't come forward in a crime to report uh, a crime as a witness. This is a really important bill, and um, it was balanced well with the First Amendment uh, rights of the, of the press. We, we don't want the press to be withheld to have information put out. We, we did want to have their ability, so in certain circumstances, they can get a judge to, uh, to put this forward, but for the most part, we don't, and we want to protect them, and this bill strikes that balance. Uh, ask for a yes vote. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Senate Bill 75. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. Senate Bill 75 passes. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title, Senate Bill 293. Senate Bill 293 by Senators Coleman and Fields, also Representatives Herod and Epps, concerning compensation of a student athlete for use of the, athlete, the student athlete's name, image, or likeness. Representative Herod. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And if someone could see if my bill sponsor is around, that would be great, please. Maybe to the whips. Give me... Um, one, give us one or a few seconds colloquially. Hold on. Thank you. Uh, in the meantime, um, Madam Chair, I move Senate Bill 93. 293. 293. Great. And we'll go to the bill in just uh, a moment. Or do you want to get it started? Go ahead, Representative Perry. Uh Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a great bill. <laughs> Uh, this bill is an, a, a continuation of a bill that uh, I, co I, sp I prime sponsored a few years back to ensure that um, college athletes have access to their name, image, and likeness. Uh, this bill expands the initial provisions that Colorado extended to our athletes to ensure that, uh, not, that charitable organizations could participate, um, as well as the university can participate in creating a marketplace and opportunities and help guide these uh, young students student athletes um, as they make these huge financial decisions. Um, as we know, we are in a time of great excitement for the University of Colorado Boulder in particular, but so many other schools with athletes who are now able to benefit from their name, image, and likeness. Um, I do ask for an I vote committee. I'm gonna put us just in a quick brief recess. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Senate Bill 293. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. The bill passes. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 278. Senate Bill 278 by Senator Simpson and Mullica, also Representatives Lindsay and Story, concerning a modification to the requirement that a portion of every capital construction appropriation be allocated for the acquisition of works of art. Thank you, Representative Lindsay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just for some context on SB 278, Can the you art move the bill. The, by the way, this is a CDC bill. 
Uh, Rep Story and I are on that committee. It stands for Capital Representative Development. Representative Lindsay, I need you to move the bill. Uh, yes, I move SB 278. To the bill. Uh, yes, we serve on the Capital Development Committee. Rep Story is the chair. It deals with uh, state-owned assets. And this is Jermaine. So the Art in Public Places program commissions artwork for people to enjoy in publicly accessible areas inside and outside of state buildings. Colorado law requires that not less than 1% of the state funded portion of capital construction projects fund the acquisition of public works of art in these buildings. Turn it over to Rep Story. Representative Story. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so in fiscal year 2022-23, the American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, the ARPA dollars, were used to cover state-funded portions of capital construction projects, a lot of them. But statute requires not less than 1% of state-funded portion of capital construction projects be used for the acquisition of public works of art, as was mentioned by my colleague. It is legally ambiguous as to whether or not ARPA dollars used for capital construction in that fiscal year can be considered the state-funded portion for the purposes of the art in public places as required in statute. So after discussion amongst the Office of State Planning and Budgeting, the Governor's Office of Legal Counsel, the Attorney General's Office, the Office of Legislative Legal Services, and the Office of the State Architect, it was determined that clarity was needed to determine that. That ARPA dollars used for capital construction in fiscal year 2022-23 can be considered the state funded portion and the specific capital construction projects funded by the ARPA dollars in fiscal year 22-23 have the discretion to acquire public art under the Art in Public Places program. <laughs> so, Representative Lindsay. Thank you. So SB 23278 makes clear that the ARPA dollars used for capital construction in fiscal year 22-23 is considered the state funded portion for the purposes of the Art and Public Places program. Further, it provides these projects the discretion to acquire public art under the Arts and Public Places program. And finally, it provides the legal clarity needed for these specific capital construction projects. I know, really exciting stuff, guys, but it is important, and we urge an I vote. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion on Senate Bill 278. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say no. No. Mm, the ayes have it. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title to Senate Bill 289. Senate Bill 289 by Senators Bridges and Kirkmeyer, also Representatives Bird and Sirota, concerning seeking an amendment to the medical state plan to implement the community first choice optional benefit. Representative Bird. I move Senate Bill 289 and um, the, did we have an, just the bill, just Senate Bill 289. To the bill. Representative Sirota. Thank you, Madam Chair. So members, this is a really wonderful, feel-good bill that has been on a long journey in our state for the last 10 years or so. Um, our state has been working on this Community First Choice uh, um, program in order to expand the ability of Medicaid to pay for services for people uh, to get community-based care and care in their homes. Um, not in institutional settings. And um, so this uh, was worked on and was nearly implemented and then the pandemic hit in 2019 and so, or in 2020. And so um, for the last couple of years, the Joint Budget Committee has been working on um, supporting the department HICPUF in, um, in funding the planning for this amendment to our state plan. And, um, and we are now at the point of um, hopefully passing this into law to remove duplicative services in statute um, for our existing waivers and updating eligibility for consumer directed programs to include community first choice and repealing some outdated statute and allowing for the department to continue to amend this plan. And um, 
So I think everyone should feel very, very good about ensuring that more Coloradans will be able to be cared for and served in their homes and communities, um, which is wonderful for people's health, their mental health, and also um, our purse, which my colleague will tell, us, tell you about. Representative Bird. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, I'll just point out that in addition to um, giving additional flexibility and expanding services for individuals who need intensive care and allowing them to stay in their home, this bill will allow us to draw down additional funds from the federal government to help cover the costs of um, these expanded services. After an initial investment that we are um, making in this piece of legislation, our state will save over $40 million general funding each year thereafter. So not only is this good for individuals, um, better care, better variety and diversity, um, uh, access to services, but it also saves the state money. Um, so we ask for your yes vote. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Senate Bill 289. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Senate Bill 289 is passed. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of Senate Bill 294. Senate Bill 294 by Senators Zenzinger and Kirkmeyer, also Representatives Byrd and Bockenfeld. Concerning increases in the amount of transfers from the General Fund to the Capital Construction Fund to be made on July 1st, 2023. Representative Byrd. I move Senate Bill 294. To the bill. Representative Bird. Thank you again, Madam Chair. This is, uh, members, this is a bill that allows us to take care of some additional capital construction projects that are desperately needed by our state and also IT, um, some of our IT legacy debt. We are um, upgrading IT capital projects in addition to some of the other capital. And we ask for your yes vote. Representative Bockenfeld. We ask for your yes vote. This is a great bill to fund capital construction need. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Senate Bill 294. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. Senate Bill 294 is passed. <laughs> Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of Senate Bill 173. Senate Bill 173 by Senators Fields and Liston, also Representatives Bradley and Joseph, concerning recommendations of the Colorado Child Support Commission. Representative Joseph. Madam Chair, I move Senate Bill 173 and, and the Public Health and Behavioral Report. To the Public and Behavioral Health and Human Services Report. Thank you, Madam Chair. In this report, it was just some cleanup, and I asked for a yes vote. Is there any further discussion on the committee report? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the Public and Behavioral Health and Human Services report. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. To the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. We do have an amendment. Go ahead and move it. I move L008 to the bill. And ask that it be properly displayed. And ask that it, proper, that it is properly displayed. The committee will stand in a brief recess. The committee will come back to order. Amendment L08, L008 has been properly moved. And 
and is now displayed. Please proceed. Representative Joseph. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have L008 is uh, basically just cleaning up some of the language that was a little bit unclear and also the notice of uh, maintenance to withhold income for support. We just wanted to make sure that um, some of the language are properly aligned with prior bills that have been passed by this legislature and also ensuring that the fees that someone is, is charged when it comes to any type of fraudulent submission is in line with um, other prior legislation that has been passed by this body. And also my co-prime as well noticed that there were some language actually in the bill that was not inclusive of all people, especially women. So we strike the word father-child and put parent-child instead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is there any further discussion? Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like Representative Bradley to explain how this amendment makes the bill more clear. Representative Bradley. Thank you to the good representative from uh, Akron. So we're not going to punish people with a $1,000 fine. We thought that that was too much, so we brought that down to $100. And there was a father-child um, typo that they didn't see. I didn't think that was fair to only include fathers in this. I think mothers can be delinquent on their child support as well. So we decided to put parent-child instead. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L008. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Amendment L008 is adopted. <laughs> Representative Bradley to the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, this is a very important bill for the state of Colorado. The Child Support Commission, which I am on, has worked very, very hard over the last year, really stakeholdering and talking through this and listening to both of us when we found some last minute changes. Um, what this law does is requires verbal and written advisement when child support orders are written or modified. So it kind of keeps every parent transparent of what's going on. It provides a time frame for parents to seek reimbursement for extraordinary medical um, expenses. It requires parents to share the child's health insurance coverage information with each other. It modifies the number of hours parents are expected to work to reflect the hours available to hourly workers. It requires a parent to notify child support services and the other parent when lump sum social security payments for the child are based on the oblig I can't say that word. Obligor? Obligor's disability. Okay. So there's a lot of things just to create transparency between parents that have split custody and it keeps the child first. So I ask for an I vote on this bill. Representative Joseph. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to know that this is a great bill. The bill makes changes to the child support system that were recommended by the Colorado Child Support Commission, of which Rep. Bradley is currently a member. So I am delighted to be a sponsor on this bill with her and for her to have um, allowed me to join her on this bill. So please vote yes. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Senate Bill 173 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Senate Bill 173, as amended, is passed. <laughs> Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1066. House Bill 1066 by Representative Bradley, concerning authorizing an individual to move between two adjacent parcels of public land that touch at the corners. Representative Bradley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1066 to the Appropriations Committee Report and the Ag Committee Report. To the Appropriations Committee Report. I move Amendment L008 to the Appropriations Report and ask that it be um, uh, displayed. Amendment L008 has been properly moved and is now displayed. Please proceed, Representative Bradley. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have stakeholdered <laughs> this bill to an inch of its life. And DNR just wanted some clarifications so that this bill has now become a task force. If an appointed member who couldn't attend a meeting, then the appointed member, um, then the director could appoint a member to attend the meeting as a substitute. 
Is there any further discussion on Amendment L008? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L008. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, <laughs> no. The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. To the, uh, I'm sorry, back to the Appropriations Committee report. <laughs> Representative Bradley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I ask for adoption of the Ag App report as amended. So we're going to actually do appropriations, and then we'll get to the um, other report. Oh, I said app. I'm sorry. I should have said appropriations. Oh, OK. <laughs> Perfect. OK, so to the Appropriations Committee report, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the uh, app Appropriations <laughs> Committee report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The Appropriations Committee report, as amended, is adopted. To the Agri Agri Agriculture, <laughs> Water, and Natural Resources Committee report, Representative Bradley. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a tongue twister. I move L006 to the Ag report and ask that it be displayed. The amendment has been properly moved. And is now displayed. <laughs> Representative Bradley to the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. This was just clarification to get the Farm Bureau and the Cattlemen's Association on. It's adding another member to the Ag Department, from the Ag Department. It's also adding another lawyer with expertise. They would like it to say, um, to address the issue instead of allow the public to assess public land that is blocked. And then um, the last part, it's just cleaning it up to get more of the stakeholders on board. And I ask for an I vote. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L006. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. L006 is adopted. Representative Bradley to the Ag Committee report. I ask for the adoption of the Ag report as amended. Is there any further discussion on the committee report as amended? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the Ag Committee report as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Is everyone sleeping? The committee report is adopted. To the bill. Representative Bradley. Thank you, Madam Chair. When I first started out, this is one of my first bills, and I thought as a freshman legislator I knew everything about everything. And turns out when you think that your bill's not contentious, we, you are very wrong sometimes. So I did a lot of stakeholdering, a lot and a lot and a lot of stakeholdering, and we decided to do pretty much a strike blow. So we took care of this bill. It is now a task force. Rep Velasco and I are putting it in the hands of the ag community and the recreational enthusiast community, lawyers to make sure that private landowners don't have anything done to them that would um, hurt their capabilities. But what this is doing for the people that don't know what corner crossing is, it's landlocked public land that is surrounded by private land. And taxpayers pay for this public land. So we want to come up with a good solution, whether that's a volunteer program between recreational enthusiasts and private landowners, or an easement where we pay private landowners to let the public have access. And this task force is going to get us there, I think. And it's going to help uh, landowners be able to sue when people are on their property, and they shouldn't be. Um, I'm really happy with where this bill has taken us. I'm super excited to have Rep Velasco on this bill with me, and I would ask for an I vote. Representative Velasco. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and I am very proud to be co-sponsoring this bill with, <laughs> with Rep Bradley. I remember when I heard this bill in AG, and she was committed uh, to making sure that all the, pe the parts and uh, stakeholders were engaged and making this work. So I really commend you for doing the work and making this uh, a task force where we're gonna get very good information uh, that might lead to good solutions uh, maybe next year. So uh, I urge and I vote, thank you. Representative Holtor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the bill sponsors for working so hard on this bill. When it was first introduced, it was dead on arrival in its original form. And I will tell you that in this 
country and in this state, we have to understand the importance of private property rights. The foundation of our nation, yeah, that rhymes. The foundation of our nation is built on private property and private property rights. Now, most of you know that I'm a long time, 20 plus year member of the Colorado Farm Bureau. If you didn't, you know now. Also a past county president of Washington County for many, many years, and I sat on that board for decades. Let me tell you, in that organization, private property rights are so important, particularly to farmers and ranchers. So, I think the bill sponsor began to understand that this problem of public, private, and access and easement is complicated. And there's extreme liability that goes along, particularly for private landowners, that public lands don't have. Now, I'm really glad that she didn't give up and she continued to work and listen to those in the agricultural community and the Colorado Farm Bureau. That has led to this study bill. She continues to listen and I think the, the population and the members of the study group will come up with a good idea. But here's what needs to be the corpus of any follow-on legislation. And I say this to the bill sponsor so in the future we can get to a solution quicker. Any access needs to be voluntary, number one. Number two, Department of Parks and Wildlife needs to negotiate with the private landowner and there needs to be an easement that is given either voluntary out of the good grace of that private landowner and their desire to support whatever ac outdoor activity that is, be it hunting, be it um, looking for Indian arrowheads, for example, or hunting ducks, or hunting geese, or hunting wabbits. You might want to hunt wabbits. So, it needs to be voluntary, it needs to have easements, and if the landowner so desires, that easement needs to have a compensation. That's how we all in agriculture get behind any future legislation. With that, I want the bill sponsor to know I will be a reluctant yes. Representative Bradley. Thank you to the good representative from Akron. Um, I agree with you 100%, and that's why we're going to create a task force that's very heavily dependent on the ag community to come up with a plan before eminent domain sets in or something worse to private property owners. I agree with you, I am a private property owner. I don't take this lightly, but I don't take lightly not having access to public lands either that I pay for. So I urge a yes vote, thank you. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of House Bill 1066 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and House Bill 1066 as amended is adopted. Mr. Sheeple, please read the title of House Bill 1048. House Bill 1048 by Representative Luck concerning delineating your posts on a two-lane state highway. Representative Basenecker. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1048, the Transportation, Housing, and Local Government Committee Report and the Appropriations Committee Report. To the Appropriations Committee, I, I don't believe that there's an Appropriations Committee Report, Representative Basenecker. How would you feel about jump into the Transportation Committee Report? I'd feel great, but I think Representative Luck would feel even better. Wonderful, let's do that. Representative Luck. Thank you, Madam Chair. So. Um, Folks, this is a bill that was born out of community concerns, uh, folks who have been looking at the road conditions. So you may be aware that the population of Colorado has increased 34% since 20, 2000. And in that time, the traffic on our roads has also increased 31%, which makes sense because they're, they're 
comparable. Well, Members, it is getting a little loud in here. That is so much better. Thank you. Please proceed, Representative Locke. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, our, the roads are the back, our roads are the backbone of our state's economy. With 46.8 million miles driven and $332 billion worth of commodities transported every single year. Many of our two-lane highways are full more and more, are filled more and more with oversized vehicles and with farm equipment. Unfortunately, they're finding it difficult to navigate these roads because of the way that CDOT has placed delineator posts. So think those T posts, those metal posts along the road with the little reflectors on it so that in bad weather, weather you can be able to discern where the end of the road is. Those delineator posts, because they are not staggered, because they form, they're, they're run parallel to each other on either side of the road, when you have oversized vehicles like a combine or other farm equipment, or if you have oversized loads like wind turbines that take up more than their lane of the highway, when they, fit, when they come and are approached by oncoming traffic, they have to make a decision. Do they hit the oncoming traffic or do they hit the post, damaging their equipment. Well, oftentimes they choose to hit the post, damaging their equipment. Or they'll stop and then cause a traffic hazard behind, especially if there's any form of hill. And so what this bill does is seek to simply stagger the delineator posts on the highway so that they're not providing a barrier um, and so they're not having to be weaved in and out of. It also allows CDOT where it is appropriate to use flexible delineator posts. So the kind that you run over and they bounce back up. Think those clowns from when we were a kid that you could punch and they would fall back and, and come back up. Do you know what I'm talking about? That's what this would do. It would preserve the, the equipment. It also preserves the posts. These posts will not be changed out all across the state. They'll be changed out when we're talking two-lane highways in particular areas where farm equipment are, is likely to be present. And they'll only be changed when CDOT is already present for a project. CDOT has a 10-year plan to update rural area highways. And so as a result, um, we don't have an appropriation, hence the need to not have an appropriation report. And so um, I urge an I vote. And I hope my co-prime joins me in wanting an I vote, too. Representative Basenecker. Thank you, Madam Chair. I certainly do. Um, we heard this bill in the Transportation, Housing, Local Government Committee. Um, it really did strike me as just a common sense safety measure, both in terms of protecting property, but also in terms of protecting people who traverse our roads, whether it's uh, on a vehicle, farm equipment, large trucks, it could be a motorcycle, honestly, it could be a cyclist. And the flexible delineator posts, I think, add a level of safety to navigating our roadways. And staggering the posts, quite frankly, just makes sense. So I appreciate Rep Luck's work on this bill, for inviting me onto this bill, and we'd ask for an I vote on the committee report. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the Transportation, Housing, and Local Government Report. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the Transportation Committee Report is adopted to the bill. Representative Basenecker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the bill is the committee report and vice versa, so we'd ask for your I vote. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 1078? Representative Winter. Thank you. I appreciate the bill sponsors for bringing this, um, especially the sponsor from Penrose. I sat in on committee with this, and it's coming from a really good place. It's a constituent issue. In rural Colorado, this is serious. I mean, coming down the highway, um, you know, we have tractors, semis, school buses. This is very important for us. It's very important for road safety. And I really appreciate you bringing this, uh, not only for your district, but my district as well. And I urge an I vote. Thank you. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really want to thank my colleague from Larimer County for bridging the rural urban divide. He has delineated a very important delineation. And I want to explain to my colleagues that don't have to run implements down the road in rural Colorado. 
because if you know anything about um, cutting hay, you got to have a swather or a disc mower. How many people have laid down hay in this chamber? Thank you. There we go. Okay, I think I got four. So we know that a head on a swather is 12 foot, in increments of two, usually 16, 18, and now they have 20 foot heads. Oh, on a combine. Sir, are we gonna get to the uh, two lane state highway bill? Yes, ma'am. We getting there? Just hold on. Okay, hold just, on. We're getting just there. checking in on you. I'll try to speed this story up, but this is important to bridge this divide. And many of you have been on these roads when farm implements are trying to shuttle from one field to the other. And they have to get down a state highway. Now I've got a new hull into 8080H. Anybody know what that was? Disc mower, 18 foot head. It's a beautiful machine. But when I have to take that machine from one hay field to the other, think about 18 feet shuttling down the road. You can't do it unless you get over when traffic's coming. With this bill, now, Madam Chair, here's where I'm getting real, real dialed in on why this is so important. And for Representative Basinecker, he's really going to understand why he is closing the rural-urban divide right now. Because now with this bill, those offsets are going to allow you to more safely and carefully and with the flexibility maneuver that machine in oncoming traffic so you don't have an accident Nothing would scare me more when I was running my New Holland 8080H down the road, and it'd only do about 25, 30 miles an hour to try to get to the next field and worrying about that oncoming traffic. I mean, it scares a living lily out of you. When you see a semi-truck coming down the road, blowing and going, catching 15 gears, probably doing 80, except now we have legislation that's going to be more expensive, so they're going to slow down to 75. Thank you, Representative Sober. <laughs> but you really, really need to understand, this is going to make Colorado agriculture safer. And, and the WIFE organization, Women in Farm Economics, supported this bill. Now, I'm going to tell you why they did that for you ladies out there that want to learn about agriculture and bridge that rural-urban divide. Do you know how to drive in front of or behind these things with the flashers going in the pickup or the car because the pickup broke down to get to the next field? Well, now you know. Somebody's got to do that. Now, some people, mom is still in bed when you're out there and you do it without her. Or daddy, it depends, you know. So, I'm in big support of this bill. I hope you've appreciated the rest of the story, you got the lesson for free, and remember, you're closing the rural-urban divide. Thank you. All right. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1048. I'm sorry, the passage of House Bill 1048. All those in favor say aye. Aye! All those opposed, no. <laughs> House Bill 1048 passes. Madam Majority Leader Duran. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move the committee rise and report. You have. There, we're we're going to take I another miss. crack at that. You've heard the motion. <laughs> Seeing no objection, the committee will rise and report.
the House will come back to order. Mr. Schiebel, please read the report of the Committee of the Whole. Madam Speaker, the Committee of the Whole begs leave to report it is under consideration the following attached bills being the second reading thereof and making the following recommendations thereon. House Bill 1048 is amended, 1066 is amended, passed on second reading, order and gross, then placed on the calendar for third and final passage. Senate Bill 75, 173 is amended, 277, 278, 281, 288, 289, 293, 294, passed on second reading, order revised and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Representative Wilford. You've heard the motion. The motion before us is that the House adopt the report of the Committee of the Whole. There are no amendments at the desk. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Bockenfeld, Hamrick, Holtorf, Lindsay, Mabry, Marshall, Soper, Winter. Okay. Representative Mabry is excused and he owes us $10. Please close the machine. With 47 aye, 15 no, and three excused, the report of the Committee of the Whole is adopted. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move the following bills be made special orders at 7.24 p.m. Senate Bill 88, Senate Bill 66, Senate Bill 179, Senate Bill 209, Senate Bill 270, Senate Bill 65, and Senate Bill 282. Seeing no objection, the bills listed by the Majority Leader will be made special order at 7.24 p.m. Representative English. <laughs> Members, you've heard the motion. Seeing no objection, the House will now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for consideration of special orders. Representative English will take the chair. The committee will come to order. With your unanimous consent, the bills will be read by title unless there's a request for reading a bill at length. Committee reports are printed and in your bill folders. Floor amendments will be shown on the screen and on your iPads. Bills will be laid over upon motion of the majority leader. The court rule is relax. Mr. Schiebel, can you please read Senate Bill 2388? Senate Bill 88 by Senators Pelton B. and Fields, also Representatives Winter and Martinez, concerning an offender's eligibility for release from confinement. Representative Martinez. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Senate Bill 2388 and the Judiciary Committee Report. To the bill. 
I mean, I'm sorry, to the judiciary report. Um, we didn't have any amendments on there, and uh, the bill is on uh, the committee report. We urge an I vote. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none. The question before us is the adoption of the judiciary report. All those in favor, in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The, the Judiciary Report is adapted to the bill. Representative Martinez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this is a really simple bill. Um, and again, this is something that, um, for those that don't know, I've been uh, very um, adamant about this um, session is on criminal justice reform. <clears throat> um, so this really looks at the study of mandatory minimums, whether they're effective or not, and being able to report those back to the General Assembly um, to make further recommendations. Um, we, we think this is a great bill and, and helpful in our fight. So we urge an I vote. Representative Winner. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Chair, uh, agree with my colleague from San Luis Valley. This is data, science driven. I mean, we want to be able to take the information, take a look at it. If it's working, we stay with it. If it's not, we tweak it. It's a good bill. Vote yes. Is there any further dis discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Senate Bill 2388. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. No. The ayes have it. Senate Bill 88 is passed. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of Senate Bill 2366. Senate Bill 66 by Senators Simpson and Hansen, also Representatives Byrd and Lynch, concerning changes to the Advanced Industry Acceleration Programs. Representative Byrd. I move Senate Bill 66. To the bill. Representative Lynch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to do a return on investment with our state's money. This, this program, over the, over the past few years, has invested over $128 million that has resulted in 4,423 new jobs, 4,500 uh, jobs have been retained, 124 new companies created, 624 patents filed, $2.5 billion in follow-on capital. This has resulted in a huge return on investment for the state of Colorado. There's a couple different ways that these grants work, uh, actually three different ways. There's a proof of concept grant, there's an early stage capital and retention grant and a collaborative infrastructure grant. Um, I've seen this bill in work, uh, at work in northern Colorado in the, uh, in the innovation center there outside of Fort Collins, I believe in uh, our representative from Larimer County's district. Um, this is a great bill that affects uh, advanced manufacturing, aerospace, bioscience, electronics, energy and natural resources. Uh, infrastructure engineering and technology and information. This is a great use of the state's money and I would encourage a yes vote. Representative Byrd. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, members, this is the Advanced Industries Accelerator Grant Program, which has been in place as Minority Leader Lynch described for um, quite some time and has resulted in growth of several significant industries that pay Coloradans good wages. Um, the intent really is to make Colorado a hub for the advanced industries. And when that happens, um, the industry really grows and um, becomes self-sustaining without help eventually, and also becomes great opportunity, again, for well-paying jobs for Coloradans. And we urge a yes vote. Is the Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to come and say how much I love this bill. Uh, the um, advanced industries uh, is one thing that uh, we pushed in another bill that we voted on earlier today, uh, 1260. And so this bill and that bill and a supplemental we passed earlier in the session, all of them go uh, hand in hand together. And it's really taking Colorado from being a top eight or nine state, depending on which calculation you're looking at, to being a top five state uh, for advanced industries. We, we have the workforce, we're the second most highly educated state in America, and being able to put these investments out there and to help companies uh, reinvest in Colorado or to invest for the first time in Colorado means that uh, we have a brighter future waiting for us. Thank you. 
Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Senate Bill 2366. All those in favor, say aye. All those opposed, no. Senate Bill 66 is adopted. Mr. Shebo, please read the title of Senate Bill 23179. Senate Bill 179 by Senators Moreno and Noel, also Representatives Hartsook and Doherty, concerning insurance carrier requirements for health coverage plans and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Representative Hartsook. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, members, what's can interesting about this? Can you please move this? the bill? Sure, we can move the bill too while we're at it. <laughs> I move Senate Bill 23179. To the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, who's ever been to the dentist? We all have. Who's ever had crowns, root canals, anything like that? What we don't know, and things in the decades have not changed, is what is covered in insurance for getting the crowns. And it's not very much. You're looking at maybe $1,000 to $1,500. Those prices haven't changed in years and years, over decades. In the medical industry, there's a thing called the MLR, which is your medical loss ratio. That, on your insurance, you can look at it as a consumer and figure out how much is going towards overhead and how much is going towards patient care. No such thing exists in the dental industry. So we are putting a two-year DLR study that will go out there to collect the data that will look at and decide where's the threshold. Is it 80%, 85%, 83%? What is that threshold that it sets at? So you as a consumer will know what you're spending towards overhead and what you're spending towards actual insurance coverage and then you can look at what's going to get you better coverage in the future. Having worked in this industry, wife's in this industry, Colorado uh, Dental Association's behind it, we stakeholder this thing through and through. This is a good thing for consumers, for the market, for competition, and for letting people know what they're going to be spending going forward on their insurance. I urge an I vote on the bill, thank you. Representative Doherty. Thank you, and I'll just echo what was said. This is a great bill for consumers. It places disclosure requirements around dental loss ratios, and we ask for an I vote. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Senate Bill 179. All those in favor, say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. Senate Bill 179 is passed. <laughs> Mr. Sheba, please read the title of Senate Bill 23209. Senate Bill 209 by Senators Janal and Rich, also Representatives Taggart and Ricks, concerning removal of the date restriction and the definition of eligible borrower used to determine a business's eligibility for a small business recovery loan under the Clymer Act. Representative Ricks. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. Can you move the bill? Yes. <laughs> okay. Anyways. Um, so I move SB 23209. In the to, committee report? Or just the bill? To the bill. Okay. And basically, this bill is a technical fix for the Climber Act, which, and this bill is going to remove erroneous dates that were put in the original bill and is going to correct it. There is no appropriation required on this bill. Representative Taggart. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you to my co prime on uh, the description of this bill. Unfortunately, the bad date that's in this, um, in the act right now, has a date of February 29th, 2020. Three years plus have passed, and for, for us to continue um, to, to get, to pass through grants to our Main Street merchants, three-year-old data is not good data. Um, so this requires them uh, to give us their most recent, um, gosh, why has my mind gone blank? It's a debt coverage ratio that's strictly their EBITDA divided by their principal interest, uh, their principal and interest. Does everybody, as a business professor, I'm, gonna, I'm going to give you a quiz on that. So what is a debt coverage ratio? Earnings before interest taxes and Members, one second. <laughs> Members, can we quiet down just a little? Thank you. <laughs> Divided by principle. This just clears up those dates. Thank you. Is there can any further discussion? No. Representative Holtorf.
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the bill sponsors. Um, I understand the desire for the sponsors to make this data correction. I understand their desire for the General Assembly to provide money to help uh, Main Street and small businesses that were so, so damaged by very bad state public policy um, that was uh, implemented by uh, CDPHE in 2020 <clears throat> that crushed, 2020 and 2021, that crushed Main Street and small businesses. I do understand that. Um, but I have never been a supporter of the Climber Act. I've never been a supporter of the state treasure underwriting loans. Um, I also think that Colorado's Grants A Go Go program is out of control. And with respect to the funding, I want to remember and remind everybody, and I did this in the committee today too that everyone wants to talk about pulling down federal dollars, this magic money from the sky. We gotta pull down and capture or trap federal dollars. Well, this morning when I looked at the federal debt clock, for those of you that look at it every day, it's $31 trillion with a T. Yeah, what? $31 trillion with a T. Now, let me compare that to uh, a person like me. That rhymes, by the way. You've got a credit card in your wallet and you want to go buy something. But you realize that your credit card limit is maxed out. Well, that's what's happening right now in Washington, D.C. And that's what I want all of you to see. That when you think you're pulling down federal dollars, for programs like this, or other programs that help Colorado, you're making that number go higher. Representative Holtorf, can you, can you share how this is to the bill? Certainly. <laughs> because now, by doing this, we're going to offer more grants a go-go. And the Climber Act and all the things that promote this are going to follow with federal dollars or ARPA dollars or ARPA dollars that we don't want to have clawed back by the federal government. Well, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I would gladly give that money back to the federal government if we could pay down that $31 trillion and take that debt off of my kids and my grandkids. Because my grandkids, two and three, someday are going to have to have this come to Jesus meeting with this debt. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't just keep doing this forever. We are losing, now ma'am, you're going to have to get ready because I'm going to get a little Western. We are losing our place in the world. We are losing our credit reputation in the world stage. Our United States dollar is now being supplanted by other international currency. To because the bill. of the lack of strength. Holtorf, please, to the bill. Thank you. I think my blood pressure is going up. I better sit down, ma'am. Any further discussion? Representative Taggart. I share the concern that my colleague just um, spoke of, and, and that is that our federal debt is, is at an astronomical level. Having said that, this is an incredibly good cause. We can't afford to have our merchants go down on Main Street. It's the core of our communities, especially when it comes to our rural communities and our smaller municipalities. We need those downtown cores to be healthy. These dollars are, have already been distributed to the states. It's not going to add um, a penny, not, not a penny to our debt. It's already in the debt calculation. 
If this wasn't a good cause, I wouldn't be up here sponsoring this, but Main Street for all of us is really vital. Representative Ricks. <laughs> Members, there, there is no physical note attached to this. This is simply a, fixing an error. We ask for your yes vote. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Senate Bill 209. All those in favor, aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no. Senate Bill 209 is passed. <laughs> Mr. Shebo, please read the title of Senate Bill 23270. Senate Bill 270 by Senator Robertson Simpson, also Representatives McCormick and Catlin, concerning activities that restore the environmental health of natural stream systems without administration. Representative McCormick. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Senate Bill 23-270. To the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. This bill um, will provide some legal clarity for minor stream restoration projects that have been happening across our street. street our state for a long, long time. Healthy streams are very important to provide wildfire resilience, drought mitigation, flood safety, water quality, watershed health, riparian and aquatic habitat. And these shared benefits support local economies, working lands, protect public safety, and contribute to environmental health. We need this because over the decades, Colorado's streams have been degraded, um, whether from natural disasters like the many fires and floods that we've had, land use practices, overuse, and other, other factors. And the projects that, that this particular bill brings to address are what are needed to restore these waterways so we can preserve Colorado. Um, some of these projects have had a meaningful impact even on my district where we have had um, to repair streams from the 2013 flood through Longmont. Um, and it is important that these projects can be relied on um, and, and move forward. It's been through months of stakeholder work uh, to get to the condition it's, it is now. Um, with a, a lot of voices involved in this bill, it did pass through the Senate unanimously, not that that should mean anything to us. But it did, um, and it was really because of listening to all of those voices to come up with a bill that we have today. Um, it's really important to, to restore our streams and our watersheds. Um, you can think of our watersheds as a second uh, snowpack, uh, as a storage mechanism, but also just the health of all the parts of these, uh, where these streams touch. And I urge a yes vote on Senate Bill 270. Representative Cannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It's an honor, honor to, to serve, serve with, with you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Members, I'm here to, this evening to talk about stream restoration. In the state of Colorado, we've been blessed with some of the best looking streams and rivers in the world. This bill will allow people that own streams or that are friends of that stream to do restoration work in the stream and alongside the bank. As was just mentioned by my co-prime, floods have done tremendous damage to the state of Colorado. This will allow small projects to get in those streams and start to rebuild the banks, start to take care of the wetlands, and start to give those streams back the life that they had prior to being damaged. These are the kind of things that we're wanting to do in the state of Colorado because what we've tried to do in the past hasn't really worked. Some of our streams are beyond recognition. And some of these kind of projects will allow those streams to come back to life and to have the life that they had before the damage. What we're talking about are small, small repair projects. No more than a quarter of an acre of surface water to be retained. That's the size of a city lot. So it's not gonna cause problems for downstream users. It's not gonna cause problems for upstream users. That's the point of this program, is the small ones should go forward. If there's injury, 
to a water, water right downstream, that individual can go to court and claim damage and make the proponents prove out. But these small projects are not that type of project. So these are the kind of things I think Colorado can start to do. And I will tell you that when this bill came about, I was an opponent because it went too far, too fast, without water court. After the work that was been done and after the Senate version came over, you could see that this is the type of project that people can get behind. These are the kind of things that should be done and can be done. So I want you to know this is a good bill. Vote yes. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Senate Bill 270. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Senate Bill 270 is passed. Mr. Shebo, please read the title of Senate Bill 2365. Senate Bill 65 by Senators Lundin and Bridges, also Representatives Byrd and Wilson, concerning changes to the Career Development Success Program and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Representative Byrd. I move Senate Bill 65. To the bill. Representative Byrd. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, members, this bill relates to the Career Development Success Program that is currently administered by the Department of Education. This program provides financial incentives to schools that encourage secondary students to enroll in qualified industry credential programs, internships, or construction industry apprenticeship programs. Beginning in fiscal year 23-24, the bill before, or well, it's not before you, but the bill we're considering right now, increases the annual minimum appropriation for the program from $1 million to $5 million and extends the repeal date of the program from September 1, 2024 to September 1, 2034. The reason for this, members, is that this um, program has been incredibly successful and demand has far outstripped uh, the available resources. So the intent is to um, be able to reimburse our schools in the amount of $1,000 per pupil that successfully completes one of these programs. But because there is such interest, no school district has been able to draw down the full amount of the reimbursement. So that's why you are seeing um, in this bill an increased appropriation. So again, the bill appropriates $5 million in additional funding for fiscal year 23-24. And this is for the purpose of doubling the total per pupil revenue. Um, that is awarded to school districts and charters that require all, school, all students to enroll in and successfully complete a qualifying program or advanced placement course prior to graduation. The last comment I'll make, um, why I'm so excited about this program, is that uh, every, everything that students are encouraged to do, all of the programs that are intended to be funded through this, are all relevant in-demand careers. So not only is this good for our students, but it's a fantastic investment in workforce. Representative Wilson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as my co-prime sponsor mentioned, this is a really good program that we're continuing. This program has tri doubled and tripled year over year, and it's resulted in a in in lesser funds for the school for paying for these programs this gets students before they graduate gets them involved in things like plumbing welding uh, medical care those trades and those high demand jobs that we're looking for in the workforce so um, I would ask for an I vote good bill good bill vote yes is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 2365. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. Good job. Senate Bill 2365 is adopted. Mr. Schiebel, please read title. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to lay over Senate Bill 282 until tomorrow. Senate Bill 282 will be laid over until tomorrow. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Move the committee rise and report. You have heard the motion. Is there any objection? <laughs> Seeing none, the committee will rise and report.
The House will come back to order. Mr. Schiebel, please read the report of the Committee of the Whole. Madam Speaker, your Committee of the Whole begs leave to report as under consideration the following attached bills, being the second reading thereof and making the following recommendations thereon. Senate Bill 65, 66, 88 is amended 179, 209, 270, passed on second reading, order revised and placed on the calendar for third reading final passage. Senate Bill 282, laid over until May 4, 2023. Representative English. The motion before us is that the House adopt the report of the Committee of the Whole. There are no amendments at the desk. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Bachenfeld, Degree Kennedy. Mabry, did you pay your $10? Was it Mabry? I think Valdez paid it. Uh, Epps, Garcia, Hamrick, Lindsay, Story, Titone, Woodrow. Okay, please excuse Degree Kennedy, Garcia, Titone, and Woodrow. And everybody feel free to remind them they all owe us ten, oh, ten dollars. Ten dollars. Representative Sirota. Oh, please close the machine. <laughs> With 48 I, 13 no and four excuse, the Committee of the Whole report is adopted. Representative Sirota. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Tomorrow, House Appropriations will meet at 8 a.m. in the Old State Library to hear House Bill 1084, House Bill 1200, Senate Bill 3, Senate Bill 148, Senate Bill 164, Senate Bill 251, Senate Bill 263, Senate Bill 271, Senate Bill 275, Senate Bill 292, Senate Bill 295, and Senate Bill 213. Thank you. Representative Hamrick. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, the Majority Leader has approved my absence from the floor this Friday, 8 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Thank you. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move to lay over the balance of the calendar until tomorrow. Yes. Seeing no objection, the balance of the calendar will be laid over until tomorrow, May 4th. Yes. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the House stand in adjournment until Thursday, May 4th at 9 a.m. The House is adjourned until Thursday, May 4th at 9 a.m.